they'd be almost impossible to detect, but if there's enough of them, they could account for the gravity that keeps entire galaxies from flinging stars off into space. And maybe, just maybe, some sterile neutrinos are decaying and causing this weird spectrum of X-ray radiation. Or maybe they don't exist at all, and I just spent the last five minutes scrambling your brain for no reason. Or maybe they don't exist at all, and I just spent the last five minutes scrambling your brain for no reason. All right, I'm just going to start this off so that you have some idea where I'm going. I'm claiming that these circles here are ether. They are magnetic fields displayed in ether. There are only a handful of experiments in physics that completely transformed physics. Only a handful. To recap, if it is the telescope that is moving, then when it is filled with water, it has to be tipped further to see the star. If the telescope is stationary and the starlight drifting past us, then it does not have to be tipped further. That completely transformed physics. And it is interesting that in his report, Airy mentions that it was now about 100 seconds of arc and that it was still slowly diminishing. This indicates that the speed of light was still decreasing in measurable amounts when Airy performed his experiment in 1871. The result of Aries' experiment, known as Aries' failure, was that the telescope does not have to be tipped further. This proved that it was the incoming light that was moving past a stationary telescope fixed to the stationary Earth. What is interesting, in his very brief report of only four pages, is that not once did he refer to the astonishing results that the experiment proved. That the Earth was stationary. That the Earth was stationary. That completely transformed physics. This experiment was also dismissed by Wikipedia, which said Ether Drag Test under the main article Luminiferous Ether. By means of a water filled telescope, Airy in 1871 looked for a change in stellar aberration through the refracting water due to an ether drag. Like in all other ether drift experiments, he obtained a negative result. This is a gross distortion of the truth. That he did not have to change the angle proved that it was the ether drifting past the stationary surface of the Earth. Well, there you have it, everyone. Peer reviewed, just what people want to see. So why is this ignored? Well, you know why this is ignored, because this definitely tells you that the Earth is not moving. In fact, no experiment ever has shown that the Earth moves. That completely transformed physics. At m many people's top of the list would have to be the Michelson-Morley experiment. Tell us about that. Well, they used light beams to measure whether the Earth was moving, and they found that there was no movement. Was, the Earth has to be moving 30 kilometers per second to complete its annual revolution. And they found out that it wasn't moving by, in a very precise, Michelson could have calculated it to one hundredth of what he got in his experiment. That's how sensitive his instruments were. In the 19th century, physicists thought that since sound waves travel through air, light waves must travel through some sort of medium as well. They called this theoretical medium ether. The famous luminiferous ether, this magical medium that was hypothesized to be what light required to move through the vacuum of space, just the way sound requires air to move from one place to another. How else could waves of light move through the vacuum of space unless there was some medium there, some hypothetical medium, let's call it the ether.
it's a light wave now I am going to show you that that is a standard nice little happy wave going through the air ether they theorized is an invisible nothingness that permeates the universe its only physical property is that it allows light to propagate through it but once precise measurements of the speed of light became possible testing the predicted effects of ether on the speed of light became possible as well the Earth orbits the Sun at about 66,500 miles per hour. And they found that there was no movement. If light travels through ether, they reasoned, then as the Earth moves through the ether, the speed of light should be different going with the ether than perpendicular to it. In an attempt to show the effects of ether on the speed of light, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley conducted an experiment in 1887 at what is now Case Western Reserve University. Michelson was an expert in optical experiments, and he thought that he could devise an experiment where one would be able to see the slight difference in the speed of light measured on the Earth if you measured it along the direction of the motion of the Earth and at right angles to it. There should be a slight difference. Compared to the speed of light, Earth is not moving that fast. So if you're going to check the difference in the speed of light, measured with the movement of the Earth compared with transverse to it, you need a level of precision that, was, that, that no one had before. The Michelson interferometer was just such an apparatus. Michelson and Morley devised an apparatus that would detect minute differences in speed between two beams of light. Light from one source is split into two directions through a half-silvered mirror. These beams are bounced between other mirrors and then recombined back into a single beam. When two light beams combine, if their waves are completely synchronized, the peaks combine to make an even more intense peak. If they are one half wavelength off, their peaks combine and cancel out the intensity. Slight differences in speed between two light waves will therefore produce a pattern based on the amount of interference between the two beams. This is known as an interference pattern. Examining the interference pattern from the two light beams sent out in different directions would clearly show if the speed of each light beam were different in different directions. But Michelson and Morley never detected such a difference. Their results were inconsistent with the existence of ether. What did the experiment involve in terms of apparatus? So we can get a concrete understanding of, of well, what they if found. Well, the if the Earth is moving around the sun and we shoot that light beam in the direction that the Earth is moving, Okay, and then we shoot another light beam perpendicular to that. Well, the one that's in the direction of the Earth's movement should be impeded in some way if it's moving through space, whereas this one that's going perpendicular would not be impeded. Why not? Because it's not going through space. It's okay. just going north and south. Okay. Okay. And what they found, they expected to have a 30 kilometer difference between these two light beams. There was no difference. The scientific world didn't know what to make of it. The, the famous scientists in Europe, all uh, Lord Rayleigh and Lord Kelvin and Lord Thompson, were saying, hey, come on, you must have done something wrong here. Uh, there has to be an ether. And the whole thing didn't get resolved until many, many years later when Einstein came along. So the natural interpretation, and even Einstein admits this, Mach admits this, Bohr admits this, the natural interpretation is that the Earth isn't moving. So how do we get out of that? Well, you invent special relativity. And now you say, well, the reason that light beam wasn't affected when it went toward the motion of the Earth is because the apparatus shortened. Huh? <laughs> yeah, Michelson's apparatus shortened as it was going with the Earth in its orbit around the wait, sun. Wait, wait, you're, you're telling me that the contraction of mass yes. was invented to explain away the results of the Michelson Morley yes. experiment? Yes, and that's what my book will tell you, and it's been admitted by all the scientists. Well, isn't there any experimental confirmation that as you approach the speed of light, there's a contraction effect? I, I, the impression is that there's all kinds of experimental confirmation. That was invented. It was, there's no proof to it. All really? These, yes, all the physicists will tell you there's no proof Not, not that it. I'm surprised you understand. Yeah. Einstein's theory of special relativity proposed that the speed of light is always the same, regardless of the speed of the light source. And it is interesting that in his report, Airy mentions that it was now about 100 seconds of arc and that it was still slowly diminishing. 
The results of the Michelson-Morley experiment were entirely consistent with Einstein's view of the universe. And this served as the turning point in modern physics. Because the apparatus shortened. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah. The Michelson-Morley experiment was an experimental advance in technology that transformed science. Nobody measured a contraction, but they put it into a mathematical formula called the Lorentz transform, and it's probably the most famous equation used in physics today. That transformed science. Lorentz transform. That completely transformed physics. Does, does anyone expressly admit that, hey, we had to come up with this contraction effect because otherwise we're stuck with a motion. Yes, Earth. the very guy who invented it. Tell me what he admitted. Heinrich Lorenz says, I don't have any other explanation to this experiment of Michael Samorley unless I contract the apparatus. Otherwise, we're going to have to believe the Earth is standing still in space. Unbelievable. Yeah. The transform science. But what they're completely failing to take into consideration is all the other motions that are in play here that are considerably faster than the 1,038 mile per hour rotation. Uh, for example, the 66,000 or 67,000 mile per hour velocity around the sun, the sun around the Milky Way, the Milky Way around the Great Attractor. In other words, all of these things are well within the sensitivity thresholds of these ring laser gyros, and yet the only thing they measure is the 15 degrees per hour rotation. And that does change, by the way, by the latitude. Unbelievable. Yeah. But the bottom line is, is no other motion is detected. Um, and that, of course, is the one thing that the mainstream and all these people saying, oh, well, these fiber optic gyros and these ring laser gyros are conclusively measuring the rotation of the Earth wrong again. It is not what's happening because there would be several other velocities in there that would heavily skew those readings because of the velocities involved being highly, well, well into the threshold of de de detectability of the ring laser gyro. So, telescope does not have to be tipped further. It is a standard, nice little happy way of going through the air. Not only physics, but science. It's kind of like if you ask a geodetic surveyor, when does he use the mass for the curvature? They know it, but they've never used it. It's one of those things they're taught, but they've never actually used it that the equations allow you to have your cake and eat it. Not only physics, but science. You're like Alice through the looking glass. Remember where she goes to visit the Mad Hatter and uh, everything up is down, everything down is up, and it's just pure insanity and bedlam? I want to read you some quotes from the cult of quantum. By the way, I'm also going to quote you some of the brightest minds in current uh, theoretical physics and quantum theory and just show you how stupid and brain dead these demented a-holes really are. Now I'm going to be quoting these people directly with no subterfuge and if you have a brain to see how stupid they are congratulations if you agree with them woe unto you. Um, so by the way uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's take a quote from uh, Leonard Susskind Mm, okay, now this is a professor of theoretical physics and the priest of quantum mechanics. Him right alongside uh, a Tricky Dick, or as I call it, Richard Feynman, are the uh, yeah the leaders. Uh, now uh, Feynman's dead now. Now here's Leonard Susskind. When common sense and intuition failed, we, the insane relativists, is what he's meaning, had to create a new form of intuition based upon abstract mathematics. He means unreal nonsense. Huh? <laughs> yeah, Michelson's apparatus shortened it. When common sense fails, in other words, they had to use something other than common sense to create this crap. When common sense fails, we must create uncommon sense. This is a direct quote from this moron. Isn't that fascinating? Now, Niels Bohr, well, he's highly lauded as a genius. Let's see, quantum insanity, this is a quote from Niels Bohr. Everything which we call real must be made up of things which cannot be real. Huh? Now, that is a highly acclaimed founder of quantum mechanics who basically said everything that we think is real is made up of imaginary shit like unicorns and leprechauns. That's basically what he said. Now, this quote uh, Richard Feynman, or I call him Tricky Dicky. He's dead now. This guy is a, uh, a serious religious figurehead, the, and it is a religion, quantum is. 
This is a quote from Richard Feynman. The more you see how strange nature behaves, it's only strange if you're a moron and you can't decipher Mother Nature, yeah, the harder it is for us to make a model that explains even how the most simplest of phenomena, like magnetism, works. Theoretical physics has given up on this pursuit. He basically said this stuff is too complicated for us to figure out. We've, for, we've given up on it. Um... Let me quote you Nikola Tesla on these morons. Now, Nikola Tesla lived before Feynman, but this same sort of uh, sick Einsteinian atomistic relativism existed in the uh, days of uh, Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla says, All literature on this subject, i.e. relativity and curved space-time, a la the moron Einstein, is futile and destined to oblivion. By the way... When I call Einstein a moron, what I'm actually doing is quoting Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla also called Einstein a fuzzy-haired crackpot. Yeah. <laughs> Someone else once said, said, you can always recognize a relativist. They will either ask you for your credentials or offer uh, their credentials to you without uh, you asking for or about them. Um, here's Walter Russell on uh, the cult of quantum. Nothing is more fantastical and a travesty of how nature works than is quantum theory. Its very basis has no relationship at all to reality. Those are pretty harsh words. Here's Nikola Tesla again. Scientists today think rather deeply rather than clearly. One must be sane as opposed to insane. One must be sane to think clearly, but one can think deeply and be quite insane. Today, scientists have substituted mathematics for experimentation, and they wander through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no basis in reality. Wow, Nikola Tesla really nailed modern science on the head right there. Because the laws of science differ fundamentally from those of... <sighs> now, relativity is based upon two things, two fundamental flaws which sprang forth between the empty head of Einstein and uh, Niels Bohr, and that is the belief that uh, everything is particles. Our current understanding of the universe is based on the modestly named standard model, a theory of all fundamental matter particles and their interactions. Virtually all of the standard model has been verified. Virtually all of the standard model has been verified. A theory of a theory of a theory of virtually all of the standard model has been verified. Are you willing to, to make a bet about what kind of Higgs boson is? Do you think it's the standard model Higgs? Wow, that's a difficult one. No, I wouldn't bet my life on uh, This is if you want to know what a Higgs boson looks like, this is basically what a Higgs boson looks like. It looks like a bump in a graph. So a theory of a theory of bump in a graph. So and that is the belief that uh, Everything is particles, and also the reification of nothing, space, because Nikola Tesla said space has no properties. Space is nothing. Yeah, we just got done petting uh, leprechauns. Like, you got done doing what? We were done petting unicorns. The notion that you could curve space-time, time is not a thing. Time is a measure. It's a concept created by humans. It's a measure of the motion and vector and changes of masses. Space is not a thing. Space is like a shadow. Well, a shadow is a thing. Well, how is a shadow a thing? I'm pretty sure a shadow is not a thing. By pure Pythagorean Platonic definition, a shadow. Well, like if you stand in a shadow, you get cold. Therefore, a shadow must be something, no? Shadow is a privation of light. You see, we think, well, there's a shadow. Well, a shadow is a person, place, or thing, right? No, a shadow does not even qualify. Shadow does not exist. A shadow... This is called a reification of a posterior attribute. It's a fallacy. You can't reify a shadow as something that does something and acts on other things. You can say the privation of light is something that acts upon things. Or like you say, how could someone die of something that doesn't exist? We need to See, people don't have sharp minds anymore. Your minds are jello, just as the minds are of most people. Like, how can you die of something that doesn't exist? So, what is this Higgs boson thing and why is it so important? Well, to understand that, we actually need to ask a slightly deeper question, which is, what do I actually mean by a particle? So you could be forgiven. I sort of the way I've described this to you in the last few minutes, you could get the idea that maybe these particles are somehow like little Lego bricks, or they're a bit like the Victorian atoms. They're sort of solid little points that move around and stick together. But actually, that's not 
what modern particle physics tells us particles are. In fact, particles aren't really what matters at all. It's, our field is kind of badly named in a sense. What actually we think of as being fundamental are not particles, but fields. So, not particles, but fields. So, see, this is reification of a privation, a shadow. Space, no water in the desert, no food in a jail cell. These all are privations, but privations have effects due to a subject which requires them to have action done upon them or action that they actually uh, impel to have caused to do with a given effect, but they are not things in and of themselves. So you know, the two major fallacies of uh, quantum mechanics and relativity is the reification of two things that don't exist. Everything is fields, and fields are not particles, but these people only believe in particles. That's why I call it the cult of bumping particles. The second thing they do is they reify space as something that does stuff. Because the moron, Einstein, was perpetually referring to curved space-time. Space cannot be curved. Uh, Nikola Tesla, who is, of course, infinitely more intelligent than Einstein, you know, he poo-pooed this notion as absolute uh, nonsense. He called this sort of thinking futile and destined to oblivion. Unquote, Nikola Tesla. A field we've all probably, if you've ever held a magnet next to a piece of steel or iron, you felt the effect of a field. So a field is something that can cause, for example, a force to be exerted over a distance where there's no physical stuff actually causing that force to be exerted. No physical stuff. So you can have something, a field can be, so for example, a magnetic field, and that can you know, be strong near a magnet and get weaker as you move further away. Or it could be a gravitational field like the one that the Earth creates around it or the sun creates around it. So we believe that actually for every, in particle physics, every one of these particles has an associated field. So there is a field for the quarks, for the electrons, for the neutrinos, and for all the force particles. And the way we think of these particles are actually as little tiny ripples moving through these fields. So th that the equations allow you to have your cake and eat it. And the way we think of these particles are actually as little tiny ripples moving through these fields. So this is tiny ripples. It's a light wave. Now, I am going to show you that that is a standard, nice little happy wave going through the air. This is basically what a Higgs boson looks like. It looks like a bump in a graph. So particles, but fields. So, okay, if I didn't make that perfectly clear for you. Now... <clears throat> Let's take a field, for example, like a magnetic field. Well, what's a magnetic field made out of? Well, let's not define a field yet. I'll have to save that for future videos. Really, a field in very simple terms is an uh, ether perturbation or inertia perturbation. It's either circular, it's transverse, or it's longitudinal. Technically, it's toroidal or longitudinal. Uh, circular is just a subsection of toroidal, so it's either toroidal or longitudinal, technically speaking, if you want to get down to the nitty-gritty. These people in quantum mechanics, and these are their own words. Most people have never heard of like virtual, far, uh, virtual particles and virtual photons, but this is the shit these idiots actually believe and write about in their own books. This is the crap that they actually believe. Like, you know, what is a field? Like, it's a magnetic field. Well, it's virtual photons. Well, okay, okay, let's define a virtual photon. By the way, a virtual particle or virtual photon is not the output of any experiment ever done in history, nor would it ever be. It's just like saying, you know, we got, we did an experiment, we got unicorns. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah, it's unicorns. We got, we did another experiment, we got little leprechauns. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> So here we have the definition of a virtual particle. A virtual particle is an abstraction which facilitates in calculations and understanding. The term is very vague and loosely defined. They never appear as the inputs or outputs of experiments. Their existence is questionable at best. However, they are very useful in rendering concepts and making equations balance out. In other words, when a mathematician and math never explains anything or defines anything. It only quantifies things that can be quantified. Some things cannot be quantified, like a field, and everything is fields. You can't quantify a field. A field has no quantity. Math only deals in quantity. Crap, you can count. One, two, three, four, five, subdivision, square root. That's what I can remember. You cannot do math about something that has no quantity. You can quantize the field only 
in the four Maxwellian field equations, for example, with a vector with an effect over a period of time, and then you can quantize a field. A field by itself has never been defined. Let's say this is a field. This is as a field has never been defined. But this change over effect with x momentum, with x uh, uh, force uh, measured in joules, that can be quantized. In other words, we know nothing about a field. Science has never defined a field in itself, of itself, by itself. But they can quantify it and do math about a change over a vector with a given result. But that still never defines a field. What you're doing is defining attributional effects with vector and time variance and change. So, make equations balance out. So, mathematicians, yeah. Have you ever looked carefully at the intro for this show? You might have noticed that there's a diagram of an atom with little electrons orbiting the nucleus. But here's the thing. Atoms don't actually look like that. Over the years, scientists have come up with different atomic models, 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 models based on what we know, we know about how they work. The atomic model that's in the SciShow intro was one of them. 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 Atoms don't actually look like that. And it has a lot of history behind it. But the most accurate atomic models are a little more complicated. Because atoms are complicated. Because over the years, scientists have come up with atoms were made up of negatively charged electrons plus some sort of positive charge. Over the years, scientists have come up with the tricky part was figuring out how we know we know we know about how they work. The running theory was the often unstable, prone to weakness. The atomic model that's in the SciShow intro was one of them. That was the one tricky of them. part was figuring out how these charges fit together. The running theory was in a positive sphere, which was called the plum pudding model because it looked like a traditional Christmas pudding. But that, pudding. But that all changed around 1911, when a scientist named Ernest Rutherford, along with his team at Manchester University, published the results of the famous gold foil experiment. Regardless of the tests, however, this moment is being hailed as monumental in Israel as leaders Rutherford and his colleagues fired alpha particles at thin gold foil. According to the plum pudding model, Rutherford was right about protons being in the middle with electrons around them, and you'll still see his model used today to explain the very basics of the atom. That's why this model is sometimes called the planetary model. It's the one in the SciShow intro. But there was one major problem with the planetary model. It predicted that orbiting would lose energy, which would make them spiral inward and eventually crash into the nucleus. This implied that all atoms would eventually collapse. That's why this model is called the planetary model. But we know that stable atoms do exist. What are you saying? Do you know that stable atoms do exist? Why would he keep secrets from you? He, he wouldn't. Didn't. Doesn't. But, of course. Do you know that stable atoms do exist? So there had to be something missing. Just. Hmm. I assumed you knew, darling. To the Rutherford model that solved this problem. Bohr's model predicted. As it rotates about its axis. There had to be something missing. Just two years later, in 1913, Danish scientists proposed an adjustment to the Rutherford model that solved this problem. Bohr's model predicted electrons orbit at very specific energy levels, which at very specific energy levels, which he called orbits. Orbits. The electrons could only orbit at precisely those levels, and so they couldn't spiral inward. But only specific discrete levels were allowed, and electrons couldn't go below the lowest level. That explained why stable atoms didn't just collapse. Bohr's model quickly became the most popular, most popular, most popular, most popular, most popular model of an atom. And it's often used today to show the basic way that an atom is arranged. But it still wasn't totally right. One breakthrough was in 1932 when English physicist Chadwick discovered that neutrons exist. And they helped explain why the nucleus was so heavy. It quickly became the most popular model of an atom. But it still wasn't totally right. Another breakthrough involved quantum mechanics and the idea that electrons don't necessarily orbit the nucleus at all. Never trust an atom because they make up everything. It's funny because it's true. Particles but fields. So 
So they invented something to explain fields because to them everything is space and time, which are not things. Time is a concept. Space doesn't exist. Space is no different than a shadow. A shadow is a privation of light. So what is space? Space is actually posterior attribute of the loss of inertia or the posterior attribute of the divergence of a uh, magnetic field which creates a bubble which we would define at bubble as space becomes a toroid. The conjugate geometry of force and motion, inertia and acceleration, which is a hyperboloid and a torus together, together those define a sphere. Space and counter space, right? Electromagnetic induction. Well, you can really quantize a lot of stuff. Math is about counting things, not defining things. So, let me read uh, something else about what they think a field is. In physics, a field is a physical quantity. Is it? A field has no physical quantity. It's not even quantitative, nor is it physical, so that's bullshit. These are, these are their own definitions. Typically, a number or a tensor. You, you're going to give a number to something that has no quantity? How are you going to do that? They're only giving a number to a field in the sense of change over a period of time. You cannot quantify something that has no quantity. You know, even a child can understand that crap. But, you know, a tenured professor does not, apparently. Whew, wow. Here's their own words, too. Um, the sloppy use of the language to which physics are prone makes it lead to confusion in the student as to whether a field here means a region or a single point force vector within a given region or a set of point force vectors within a given region of all the point force vectors. Blah, 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 blah. Forces have ranges and theoretically are infinite. Uh, quantum theory of fields. What are fields possess momentum energy? See, here we go. The fact that electromagnetic field can possess momentum and energy makes it very real. Now, real would be something that has quantity. This is real. It has quantity. You know, real. A field has no quantity. A field can only be given quantity in the case of energy and momentum when you actually quantify it over time with a vector. A field in of itself has no reality. It means it is completely unreal. So if everything is a field and fields have no particles and fields are not particles and they also have no quantity, that means everything is unreal. Everything that we think is real is technically unreal. Oh my god, we've stepped into the realm of metaphysics. Which is why the Greeks were so interested in metaphysics. They understood that physics were one thing, metaphysics were another. They're just two sides of the same coin. Modern scientists are dumbasses. They think, well, this is the field of physics, and over here we got this occult shit and, you know, this crazy shit and metaphysics. You know, we got the real stuff over here, a science and tenure professors, and we got, like, uh, Madame Tussauds and her crystal ball and metaphysics. Of it. Yeah, pretty sure the ancient Greeks and Pythagoreans, Plato, Aristotle... Uh, Pythagoras, they were smarter than modern scientists by leaps and bounds. They understood that metaphysics and physics were one and the same damn thing. Just uh, different sides of the same damn coin. And suggest that Max Planck's matrix, this matrix, is the conduit. Now the idea that everything is connected is a very old idea. Even in science, in the late 1800s, there was a belief that there was an invisible web of energy that connects everything in the 1800s. And scientists were very, uh, in a very heated debate, very controversial, as to whether or not this field exists. There was a very famous experiment that was conducted to determine if the field called the, the ether field actually existed. In the year 1887, the very famous Michelson-Morley experiment was designed to tell once and for all, is the field here or no? Yes or no? The field exists? It does not exist. In my opinion, it was a good experiment. However, it was poorly interpreted. For over 100 years, our science has been based in a belief that is incorrect. It's incorrect. Now, this is very interesting. 
100 years later, 1986, the United States Air Force repeated that experiment. 1986, the United States Air Force replicated the Michelson-Morley experiment. They published the results in the very prestigious journal Nature, the scientific journal Nature. What they found was this. They repeated the experiment with good equipment, much better equipment. The bottom line is that the field exists. They found that the field is actually there. This is reported in August 1986, the journal Nature, volume 322. They said, ah, the field is there. Now, why don't we know about this? This should have made the cover of every major magazine and newspaper. This should have been on CNN headline news or Sky News. But this changes everything for the scientists because the textbooks all say the field is not there. Entire careers are based on the field not being there. And now the field is there. The telescope does not have to be tipped further. Nikola Tesla was right. I mean, th this sort of stuff is crap. You know who James Clerk Maxwell is? People think, well, T Tesla was the godfather of electricity. No, really, James Clerk Maxwell was. More so than Tesla was. Even Tesla would agree to that if they'd been con concurrent creatures. Here's James Clerk Maxwell. James Clerk Maxwell from his book, Treaties on Electricity and Magnetism. The medium of propagation, the ether, must exist. The medium must be prominent throughout our investigations. Now, this guy, the equations that he writes are absolutely astoundingly long. Some of them are countless pages long. James Clerk Maxwell was a genius. All the greats of electrical theory, the people that actually gave you the modern world, by today's standards of uh, theoretical physics and quantum mechanics and the other assholes that we, you know, put in place as tenure professors, they would have referred to these people as like spiritualists and metaphysicians because they all believed in the ether. Uh, Steinmetz, uh, Charles Prody Steinmetz, James Clerk Maxwell, Nikola Tesla, Oliver Heaviside, these are the people that gave you the modern electrical world, not assholes like Niels Bohr, Einstein, and Richard Feynman. Those people were butt scratching dumbasses. I mean, this is the crap that these people wrote. I mean, what what else can you say about me? See, uh, common, when common sense fails, we must come up with um, uncommon sense. Oh, really? Well, that sounds like a really profound statement right there. Everything which we think is real cannot be really real. Richard Feynman. The more strange we see how nature is, the more impossible we are to understand how it works. Theoretical physics has given up on their pursuit of explaining this. These people are literally the ones that created unicorns and leprechauns. Oh, excuse me, virtual particles and photons, which are not the inputs or outputs of any experiment ever done to explain what exists around a magnet. As physicists try to explain the masses of particles, they found that if they just tried to inject the mass into the mathematical equations in the most straightforward way, just put a parameter for the mass of a particle right into the math, the math didn't work. It gave rise to quantum mechanically inconsistent features. So it was recognized that you needed to have a more subtle way of introducing mass into the equations that would not spoil the fundamental symmetries, but yet would allow the particles to have different masses. You see, fundamentally, the idea is that all particles begin life as being massless. There's a high degree of symmetry associated with that. All of the particles have the same mass, zero. How do you inject mass without spoiling that symmetry, which is vital for the equations to make sense? The Higgs field does that by immersing everything in this bath, this molasses-like bath, it turns out that the equations allow you to have your cake and eat it. The fundamental symmetries are deeply preserved, and yet the way in which the particles move, experiencing different resistance-like drag force, allows them to have different masses. When we talk about a magnetic field, 
They literally quantized it because they don't believe in things that have no quantity. If it doesn't have quantity, it doesn't exist at all. It can't be. You know, there's just no chance. So they had to quantize. What's going on between... These are their own words. What's going on between uh, two poles of a magnet? Uh, virtual photons. Really? You just said leprechauns and unicorns are what's going on between two poles of a magnet. Yes, virtual photons. Yes, that's what's going on. Virtual photons. These are people that today are lauded as geniuses and experts in theoretical physics and understanding of cosmic mechanics. Th th society is F-U-C-T. Yeah, I said F-U-C-T. People are so dumb. You see, when we start making uh, heroes out of dumbasses like that, and this is the sort of crap that they produce, you know humanity is screwed. Well, no, we got TV sets and computers and Apple watches. We're such an advanced society. No, we're not. That's technology. Technology has nothing to do with uh, wisdom or comprehension of uh, Mother Nature. Wow. The more you go down this rabbit hole, the more you'll understand how stupid these people are. Many of the recent developments in physics have redefined the very notion of nothingness, the very notion of emptiness. We all, I think, have this intuitive idea of what emptiness means. You just remove all the stuff and there's nothing left. But according to these ideas of the Higgs field, even if you removed all matter and all radiation, you'd still have the Higgs field filling space. You couldn't remove that. It's an indelible part of space itself. But even beyond that, even quantum mechanics tells us that there's unavoidable activity within space itself. Because of the uncertainty principle, there's always a certain amount of unavoidable jittery activity, even in realms that ordinarily we consider devoid of everything. So modern physics has redefined this notion of emptiness. And even more stupid than them are the people that believe that these people know what the hell they're talking about. It's absolutely amazing. It's astounding, the stupidity. It's just mind-bogglingly dumb. It's been a kind of a string of bad news. This is, a, this is a story from 2011, actually, even before the Higgs was found, saying certain results were sort of really causing some problems with some of the other theories that we were looking for, particularly supersymmetry. So there were some ideas when the LHC was first switched on that there'd be so many supersymmetric particles, so many particles, we wouldn't be able to handle them, and our, we wouldn't be able to read out the data quickly enough. Actually, what happened is there's, there's not been a sign of these things at all. So there's one from 2011. This is another one from 2015. LHC keeps bruising, difficult to kill supersymmetry. Popular physics theory running out of hiding places. So you get the idea. And this, is, this has really honestly been the story, actually, of the last, um, well, last four and, four and a half years, five years now. Stupid people eat this crap up. So the thing you have to be very careful about, and experimentalists and generally physicists as a whole are very cautious when they see something like this, because there is a certain chance that this kind of bump could just be a fluctuation. It's just sometimes just by random chance, you might happen to get a few more pairs of photons produced at that mass. And that's a bit, it's a bit like rolling a dice. And I mean, it's, that's what they make science fiction out of. Star Trek, Star Wars, Whoa, we've curved space time. We've got a tachyon pulse. We've got gravitons. It's like, it, it shove that particle fantasy atomistic crap right up your dark bunghole. It, it, nature has nothing to do with that stuff. Wow, mind-boggling. Particles, but fields. So... But Michelson and Morley never detected such a difference. Their results were inconsistent with the existence of ether. That the equations allow you to have your cake and eat it. A hundredth of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang, when the temperature had dropped a fraction, something strange began to happen. The entire universe seems to have become permeated with a field or presence that dramatically materialized in a similar way that steadily cooling water suddenly turns to ice. This phase change into what is now known as the Higgs field appears to have had a remarkable effect on the elementary particles. Particles, but fields. So 
that the equations allow you to have your cake and eat it. That is the idea, and I hope that you get it. If you ask me why any of these things are this way, I, I can't get much deeper without I have no idea. But it's all just ideas in people's heads and numbers in computers until we can actually coax the Higgs particle into existence and say, there! Here at CERN today, we saw history in the making. Scientific history, certainly. Down underground, a hundred meters underground, in the Large Hadron Collider, the world's biggest particle accelerator. Some people say, in fact, it's the world's biggest machine. Certainly, it's a racetrack. You see, huge numbers of magnets came together. Huge numbers of people came together from round the world into the CERN control center. And what was it they were looking for? The injection of the first beam. Which shopper was director general until 89? And this is Roger Bailey, head of the electricity section. Okay. Three, two, one. Faisal. Countdown, three, two, Wait. one, beam! And there it is. Down, down, three, two, one, and there it is. And that was the moment of the full circuit being achieved of the first beam. We saw those double flashes showing that the beam had set off and returned home. Truly a historic moment. And that's the graphical representation of the achievement, which all happened by about half past ten this morning, extremely early, of the first day. Down, down, three, two, one, and that's the graphical representation, representation, representation. So this is a a representative image of what happens when um, two particles collide. Really? Down, down, three, two, one, and that's the graphical representation. And today was the first <coughs> try to send particles, a bunch of particles, in one of the two accelerators. And in one hour, this, accelera this accelerator accepted a full turn, which is an achievement which I've never been achieved before. It wasn't any no one made a mistake. It wasn't that the, the, the experiment had got it wrong. Just sometimes by you know by luck or bad luck, sometimes you get a little fluctuation in your graph and it makes it makes you think briefly that you've discovered something new, but actually you haven't, sadly. Even though the LHC is the biggest, it definitely isn't the only particle accelerator out there. In fact, you probably live not too far from one. There are over 30,000 particle accelerators all over the world, doing a variety of jobs that sometimes have nothing to do with particle physics. For example, if you're in Paris, France, admiring the towering glass pyramid at the Louvre Museum, there is a particle accelerator 15 meters below you. Yeah, in the basement, physicists use their particle accelerator called AGLAE for cultural preservation. Agle scans priceless museum artifacts, uncovering what they're made of and making sure they're the real deal. Do you want more specifics? Of course you do. These scientists use Agle to identify the minerals in the eyes of the famous 4,500-year-old Egyptian sculpture called the Seated Scribe. I've seen it. It's awesome. For all three of you art history nerds out there, it is made of black rock crystal, white magnesium carbonate, and iron oxide. Again, super cool. How about another? Yes, please. No one likes contaminated food, right? Well, you can thank your friendly neighborhood particle accelerator for zapping any traces of E. coli or salmonella from your groceries. You've likely heard of foods being irradiated. Sounds bad, but scientifically speaking, without radiation, nothing would ever even grow on our planet. And, you know, all light is radiation, but I digress. Grocery irradiation works by shooting a stream of high energy particles into the food, thus killing all the bacteria while maintaining the quality of the produce. It's easy. It's sort of like pasteurizing milk or canning food, except scientists are using laser beams plus amazingness. So if you see this symbol next to a bag of spinach, it means it's been treated with a particle accelerator. 
and that you should probably get excited and tell everyone at the store around you. Some of the most ubiquitous accelerators aren't cyclical ones like the Large Hadron Collider, but instead they're linear, a straight line like a launch device for an aircraft carrier, but instead they're launching particles. These are called LINACs, or linear accelerators. The longest LINAC in the world is at the SLAC. It's buried underground. If you've ever driven on a section of Highway 280 in California, you've driven right over it. What? I know. LINACs, like the one at the SLAC, are used by hospitals to kill cancer. Proton therapy utilizes a particle accelerator that fires a beam right at a patient's tumor. This was a breakaway from conventional radiation therapy using x-rays, since proton therapy can target tumors without causing extensive damage to the surrounding healthy tissue. Doctors are able to adjust how deeply the protons penetrate the patient's body, which is why it is such an optimal technique. This kind of treatment is critical for head and neck tumors, which are surrounded by the brainstem and spinal cord and the tongue, basically super important structures, and you probably wouldn't want to just shoot a bunch of x-rays at them. And these are just some of the problems particle accelerators are tackling. You can find them helping scientists discover new drugs to treat major diseases, inspecting shipping cargo. The list truly goes on for this unsung hero in science. So we all know matter is made up of particles, but what the heck are particles? These smashings are called collisions. This is really all they're interested in. Yeah. They're interested in collisions, collisions, collisions. That's Mike Lamont. He's the operations group leader working on the LHC. It's his job to run BEAM. BEAM being nerdy lingo for bunches of hydrogen protons that fill up the LHC. The LHC is a ring containing two beams going in opposite directions. But if we look closer, that beam is actually made up of bunches of protons. Not particles, but fields. So... In fact, each bunch has about 100 billion protons each, and these bunches are about 30 centimeters long, um, typically about a millimeter di dimensions as they're going around the ring. And um, so think about a long, thin, tapered piece of spaghetti, piece of spaghetti. Plum pudding model. Glass is like it's a huge sea of honey. Glass is like honey. Glass is like honey. Plum pudding. Piece of spaghetti. This is looking down, straight down from the accelerator. And we can see as it comes out, this blobby plasma-ish stuff. Okay. Let's do a fairly hardcore video. Fairly, moderately so. Hardcore video on the fundamental simplicity of cosmic mechanics. And if I actually apply really fundamental, there's that word again, fundamental, um, or concrete uh, platonic retroductive logic to the nature of field theory and the differentiation out, which humans have always had and humans have not answered. Because, you know, it's every uh, epoch of human comprehension, whether it be the ancient Greeks who, I mean, they understood, as well as the ancient Egyptians, mastered some incredible stuff. Every epoch thought that they had a grip on everything that was going on. The only intelligent people were those that were actually incredibly wise, incredibly wise, and yet still knew that there was an, a tremendous amount yet to be comprehended. But Every age suffers from this egotism where we think we know what the hell's going on and we've fundamentally never reconciled um, matter from non-matter, manifest from unmanifest, nor have we differentiated out or uh, failed to actually uh, retroduct the fundamental basis of field theory because current science and physics and modern scientists are not actually uh, modern physicists who are scientists are not actually scientists in the true platonic sense because they're not interested in ultimate truth, but they are fundamentally are atomists and what they specifically are are mathematicians, but getting to the point in reconciling out matter from light, for example. Now, it is a foregone conclusion that, of course, most people don't know this, that, uh, you know, the higher the frequency of light, the more power it actually has in electrovolts, like red light is 1.7, Electrovolts, uh, green light averages about 2.3 electrovolts. We get down near ultraviolet, it's uh, about 3 electrovolts, and we go in towards uh, gamma radiation, it's much higher. But it should be the case, based upon everything we understand about the visible universe, that I can make a retroductive logical conclusion about a reconciliation between light and matter. We know for a fact that uh, once a neutron is released, that it becomes a proton, something like 17 minutes later. So fundamentally, there's only one particle. By the way, I've made countless videos on the electron, and I've, there's no such thing as an electron particle. I mean, this is a, 
a, a farcical belief in atomistic theory, which modern physics is that. I mean, it is literally mathematicians, and mathematicians don't believe in anything that's not palpable and uh, countable. Uh, people actually have made fun of me for that, but I'll actually point out to them that the greatest minds in electrical theory, like Tesla, James Clerk Maxwell, Oliver Heaviside, and Charles Proteus Steinmetz, who collectively together are a mega mountain of uh, electrical theory that gave us 100% of the electrical systems that we have in the entire world. All of these people had one thing in common. They laughed and scoffed. And I have quotes, countless quotes in prior videos, and them scoffing at the notion that an electron is a particle. So we know fundamentally there's only one particle. The neutron becomes a proton after 17 minutes. So therefore, neutron is only a differentiation of a proton given a different modality within the nucleus of an atom. So it seems apparent, and I'm going to give you some logical examples to this, that we can actually make foregone conclusions based upon platonic retroductive knowledge, and this is episteme, but specifically gnosis, where we're actually able to retroduce, retroduct uh, the nature of matter as not being anything different from that of light, and it's going to become incredibly simplistic here in a second. But somewhere in the range of 30 to 100 electrovolts, and it could be a hair higher, I mean, I'm not going to speculate on what range it is, but I mean, far, far above the level of gamma that what we call EM turns into, and I'm going to use this term, this uh, term loosely or vaguely and call it hard light, which is kind of humorous. Um, we're talking about electromagnetic radiation. It's of an such an incredibly high power that it is a quasi-stable particle. And I'm going to give you evidence for that in a second, but... It is also the case that every branch of current physics and uh, current science that's uh, chasing its ass around like a dog chasing its tail has actually tried to unify electricity, gravity, and uh, magnetism and dielectricity and the GUT, Grand Unified Theory. And of course they've always been unified. I mean, stupid human beings are like children when it comes to modern science. I mean, water and steam and ice are fundamentally, of course, just water. I mean, a pathetic child, you know, could actually uh, deduce with... Uh, small mental capacity of the fact that water, steam, and ice are one and the same thing. Human beings are trying to unify, or should I say ignorant scientists, trying to unify uh, four branches of field theory into one thing. They've already been unified. There are no dualities in nature. Nature has no dualities. Duality is a contradiction, which fundamentally is the basis for the non-comprehension of how something works based upon limited human comprehension. But if we actually take a look at a few uh, cosmic phenomena, we could actually make a conclusion, a foregone conclusion, that retroductively and uh, based upon Occam's razor, it cannot exist any other way that what we call matter, the fundamental particle, whether we call that a proton or whatever we call it, just call it a fundamental particle, is nothing other than super high energy uh, spectrum of uh, electromagnetic radiation in the extreme as far as power is concerned. Each little atom, of course, is its own dynamo. I don't want to go too long into this video without, you know, blabbing on endlessly. But as far as humans' conception, the electromagnetic spectrum ends somewhere at gamma or just above gamma, depending on who you ask. But it would be the case that the fundamental particle is nothing other than super high energy quasi-stable electromagnetic radiation, or EMR. But even EMR is incorrect because from the perspective of physics, all EMR is light, whether that be visible light or otherwise, and they think that it is a wave-particle duality, which, by the way, is the most insane bullshit conception that I've ever read from any branch of pseudoscience in my life because wave-particle duality involves three words which are absolutely not the basis for anything in nature. There are no dualities in nature, no way, no how. Nature has no dualities. A wave is not a thing. There's no such thing as a wave. Let me repeat that again if you think I've lost my mind. There's no such thing as a wave. A wave is not what something is. A wave is what something does. There is no such thing as a wave. Let me repeat that again. It's like, this is a wave. No, that's my hand moving. A wave is what something does, not what something is. So there are no dualities in nature. There is no such thing as a wave. And we take wave-particle duality in the sense that people talk about photon. Well, light is certainly not a particle. However, if it becomes powerful enough, ironically, and as we're about to uh, conclude here, based upon what we observe as far as cosmic phenomena, Occam's razor, and platonic retroduction, at extremely high power, it does become a particle, but visible radiation, gamma, ultraviolet, that's not a particle. That's a misapprehension of the coaxial nature of light, which is transverse electrical magnetic and longitudinal pulse perturbations. Because anything in the physical universe only exists 
wholly due to magnetism, which is force and motion. We only have two principles in the universe, force and motion, inertia and acceleration. If something is so, so, so massive, its uh, dielectric acceleration overcomes its magnetic, uh, the magnetic principle of that mass's matter collectively to keep it within the visible universe. So we have something that is to the human mind completely contradictory. We have something that is so incredibly massive yet it actually has no magnitude. In other words, something super massive with no magnitude. It literally got so large that it vanished from the empirical universe, which makes no sense at a superficial level, but if you actually raise your mind up a little bit, you understand that everything is a battle between two forces. Everything is pressure mediation. If the dielectric overthrows the magnetic, then something literally blinks out from the visible universe. Its mass is still there so far as a topos with Cartesian coordinates, but it has no magnitude because the mass Mass equals magnetism. The mass has vanished from the universe. So, hard light. Now, of course, I say that jokingly. We can, we can agree to call it countless different things. I'm just going to say hard light because it's slightly amusing. But uh, I mean this seriously, though. The extremely high end of the spectrum, so around, I don't know if it's above 100 electrovolts or not. But the smaller the space also, too. The smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. Hydrogen is nothing other than a fundamental particle, of course. One proton, right? Of course, there are different types of hydrogen, more complex versions of hydrogen, tritium, deuterium. Um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always thinking about a thousand things at once, but whether it's the 100 electrovolts or whatever power rating it is, because like I said, the smaller space, the higher the capacitance. Infrared is 1.7 electrovolts. Green is 2.3 electrovolts, and ultraviolet is 3 electrovolts, and gamma is much higher. But incredibly high power levels in electrovolts, what we have is the creation of a fundamental particle, which is quasi-stable. From the sense of human beings, of course, this matter, you know, it hangs around for billions of years, but in the sense of time, of course, has no meaning. Time is only a measure of magnitudes, by the way. We measure things and how long they last. From our perspective as pathetic human beings, of course, matter you know, lasts for a perdurable eternity. In conventional EMR, the coaxial circuit is mutually manifest as a field perturbation where, and this is my writing, by the way, I'm not reading this from somebody else. EMR, a coaxial circuit is mutually manifest as the field perturbation where the right-hand rule of transverse electrical magnetic perturbations exchange existence with the longitudinal propagation of the dielectric pulse perturbation. But a much higher power, instead of a blinking pulse perturbation, i.e. EMR, with a set frequency, i.e. light, whether that be gamma or visible light or otherwise, there is a fundamental soul particle creation where light requires field perturbation propagation, this hard light, so to say, attains absolute non-frequency. There's no such thing as an electron. We can say this charged cloud, because an atom, and even scientists will agree on this, is nothing more than a super, the world's, the universe's smallest um, uh, engine or dynamo. I mean, that's all any atom is, whether it be hydrogen or gold or any other atom. Every atom is just nothing other than a tiny, super, ultra, you know, the smallest type of uh, engine or dynamo. Um, everything that we call mass and matter, the fundamental particle, of which there is only one, Occam's razor and the comprehension of nature and field mechanics and applying platonic retroduction in the absolutist sense must say that there is only one fundamental particle and of course there exists harmonics of this particle. This is also Walter Russell's discovery. He actually created this flow chart, look it up, type in Walter Russell elemental chart, that everything is a harmonic of, based upon a compounding of this fundamental particle. Um, everything we call the fundamental particle, specifically the hydrogen nucleus, or hydrogen itself, because there's no such thing as an electron, Every atom is nothing other than a tiny little nuclear generator. A quasi-stable one from the perspective of stupid humans, you know, it lasts a near perdurable eternity. But they're not stable. There's nothing stable that's phenomenal. All phenomena is by definition, according to Pythagorean logic and Platonic retroduction, is unstable. That's actually fundamentally incredible. And if you actually penetrate your mind into it and think about it a second, this is the reconciliation of light versus matter. There's no such thing as light versus matter. There is only light. What we call matter, the fundamental particle, is nothing other than super high-powered, ultra-high energy, whether it be 100 electrovolts or 150 electrovolts. I don't know, but that would be the creation of the fundamental particle. That is the only logical Occam's razor's paradigm. Um, Platonic retroduction and uh, Pythagorean logic, that is the answer. The universe 
is really simple. It's that human beings are really that stupid. We think matter is one thing and EMR or light is another. They're not. They're one and the same thing. We think gravity is one thing and dielectricity and magnetism and electricity are a different thing. They're not. They're one thing. They're just different modality expressions of the same thing. Like water and ice and steam. It's all water. No, no, we got water here and ice here. And, you know, it's hard. You know, that's hard. That's, that's different because it's hard. And we got steam over here, you know. That's vapor. No, it's all the same thing. They're just different modality expressions of the same thing. So this is the absolute reconciliation of light and matter. They are all absolutely, fundamentally one thing, separated by potency or power. We literally, the premise of applying Platonic uh, retroduction is that the absolute highest in the 100 electrovolts or whatever it occurs at is an absolute non-frequency, because all EMR is a set frequency. But if it attains such a high power, its pulsation becomes a non-frequency. It is literally like a power that is akin to absolute zero. I don't know if you've ever seen or know what a super liquid is. I grew up experimenting with liquid hydrogen and superconductors, so to say. A, uh, a, uh, a super liquid chilled to a near absolute zero, liquid hydrogen, liquid helium temperatures. It's weird. It defies gravity. It flows up out of the chamber. It does weird, freaky shit that liquid's not supposed to do. Um, so at powers of incredible potency, there's no longer frequency. There still is, but it's, a, it's at a cosmic frequency that is incalculably high. And of course, every atom is nothing other than a dynamo. And that is where, of course, they generate their electrical cloud that exists around them. Someday in the far distant future, human beings will prove everything I said in this video, 100% absolutely correct. No one else has ever uh, said stuff like this before. Not that I have ever known. I've never read anybody say that uh, light uh, and matter are the one and the same thing and use any sort of logic to apply that to a conclusion thereof. The only person that's done that is me. And I say that egotistically, you could say that yes or no, but I don't know of anybody that's ever done that. But that can be the only answer to the simplicity. There is no other answer. Matter is nothing other than super high potency uh, EMR. Every bit of logic and wisdom applied to comprehending fundamental cosmic mechanics says that, that it cannot exist any other way than that. What we're actually doing is making matter. So there's, you quite often hear um, particle accelerators or colliders described as atom smashers. And that sort of suggests that what we're doing is breaking atoms apart in order to see what's inside them. But that's not really what we're interested in. But that's not really what we're interested in. What particle colliders actually are, are ways of making matter that doesn't normally exist in the universe. So you load a huge amount of energy onto each proton. They're given huge speeds. They're going at 99.999999% of the speed of light when they collide. At this point, they're carrying 7,000 times their rest mass energy as kinetic energy. So that means you can make something, essentially, that is 14,000 times heavier than a proton in the collision. They come together, the energy, their kinetic energy is converted into matter, and that's what you're seeing. So you're seeing hundreds of particles being created, and these are not things that are coming from inside the proton. Well, in some cases they are, but a lot of it is stuff that's being made, essentially, out of this kinetic energy. This happens, this process of collisions happens 40 million times every second inside all four of these experiments. And they run for most of the year, so usually from about April, March through to just before Christmas. Um, so 24 hours a day with you know, occasional technical stops. So you can get a sense of how many of these collisions are produced. It's absolutely vast. And the data challenges of coping with this rate of collisions is, is really extraordinary as well. But that's not really what we're interested in. Geneva the second largest city in Switzerland next to Zurich. It is considered to be a global city as it is the headquarters of several international organizations such as the Red Cross and UN. And in Geneva on the French and Swiss border is located the largest particle accelerator facility in the world. The European Center for Nuclear Research, CERN. Now there is an old town called St. Genus Poly, in which a large part of CERN is located such as the Alice experiment or detector. Experiment is just another word for detector. And Alice 
is located at the edge of the town along with the Atlas experiment located another three kilometers away, which is also the main entrance into the CERN campus. Some people believe that this place was once home to the Temple of Apollo, the Titan God of the Sun, the Ruiner of Worlds, the Father of Destruction, the God of Death and Pestilence, and the God of Music and Poetry and Crops and Herds and Medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Jekyll and Hyde of Gods. Now, whether there was a Temple of Apollo or not, does not change the fact that to build a facility such as CERN and to build such a machine, location is key. Think about this for a moment, folks. If you are a scientist and you want to build a particle accelerator that had the potential to tap into other dimensions, I don't think you could just build that anywhere. I would assume that you would want to pick a location that is geographically sound that is energetically appropriate for such delicate, sensitive experiments. We do not know if this place was built with the god Apollo in consideration. We do know, however, that Shiva and Apollo are both gods of destruction. And if St. Janus Pali has anything to do with the god Apollo, which is possible as there are several of these temples, I'm sure they are well aware of it. Now one of the first things to understand about CERN is that it is quite large indeed. There are about 700 buildings, 274 barracks, 325 underground facilities, 160 service areas, and 59 kilometers of tunnels. Not to mention all the roads, parking lots, and grass. This is all divided into 16 fenced sites. Far south of the campus, between St. Genis Pali and Marin is the main site, the Marin site, where there are many points of interest for visitors and employees. There is a tram stop, bus stop, helipad, restaurants, a bank, a post office, rooming accommodations, a library, a fitness trail, football field, rugby field, cricket and softball field, a picnic area, and a model aircraft runway. There is a computer center, a tech and safety training center. There's the globe we are all familiar with, along with the main entrance and reception. This place is also interactive as they have numerous educational and training programs, summer schools, all available to students interested in particle physics and the universe, as well as teacher programs, which change from time to time Sometimes there are lectures, sometimes it's computing, sometimes it's open lab. They also host regular internships and school competitions. I guess they're all throwing up what? The CERN sign? They even have an online learning environment for kids called CERNland, which is quite interesting to say the least. And what is that thing? Yeah. Okay, well, CERN employs about 2,500 people, and it is used by around 11,000 scientists from all over the world. So this is a get the best minds we can find around the world effort with all things considered. But here's the thing. Atoms don't actually look like that. Moore's model quickly became the most popular, most popular, most popular, most popular, most popular model of an atom. You know, scientists must have a lot of fun coming up with names for these things. The strong force. ISOL is a radioactive ion beam lab for the study of nuclear and atomic physics. This right here is part of the LHCB, which is a series of detectors set up in the path of collision particles to see if they can detect what's called the beauty quark or a B quark. I mean, come on, beauty quark? Are they just making stuff up at this point? They also have an LHCF or the Large Hadron Collider Forward, which is a cosmic ray simulator. You know, the more I go through these experiments, the more I realize that these guys don't know what the hell they're doing. I mean, 
they know what they're doing but don't really know what they're dealing with. Get this, there is another experiment called MODEL, the monopole and exotics detector at the LHC. Now, how many of you know what a monopole is? Well, they don't know either, but they're looking for it. A hypothetical particle with a magnetic charge, they call it. By the way, a hadron, in case you were wondering, is a particle that keeps the atomic structure together by keeping quarks bound. And the NA61 shine experiment is the study of these particles and collision of beam particles. There is the NA62, the study of the kaon, and NA63, the study of radiation and electromagnetic fields. The NTOF is a neutron time of flight facility where they make neutron pulse beams. Now Oscar, God these names, is set up for the study of dark matter and the axion, another hypothetical particle. I know what you're thinking, what's behind that door, right? Totem is a series of detectors strung along the LHC near the CMS detector, which includes four particle telescopes. They use this to detect protons coming out at specific angles during collisions. And you have the UA9 experiment set up to study crystals and their ability to steer particle beams. Now the reason I have taken you through CERN's experiments is so that you can paint a better picture of what is going on there. The collision test, the particle manipulation test, controlling the speed of particles, tearing them apart and putting them back together again to make new particles, trapping particles, magnets, extra dimensions and tiny black holes. It's important to note that black holes are only theoretical constructs and have never been proven to exist. Black holes were first discovered as purely mathematical solutions of Einstein's field equations and are not necessary in Tesla's electric universe model. You tell me what they're doing. probably live not too far from them. There are over 30,000 particle accelerators all over the world doing a variety of jobs that sometimes have nothing to do with particle physics. For example, March 24, 2015. Most of you heard about the Airbus that went down this morning. It's part of the German Wings budget airline crash. It was an Airbus 320, and that caught my attention immediately. But uh, the French president, Francis Holland, said he believed none of those on board have survived. It's in a remote location. I checked the takeoff time on this. It's very interesting. Notice where they lost contact, where they think the plane went down there as it approached CERN. Guys, right south of Geneva, Switzerland, as it got in that area, during this time, look at your time stamp. There was no solar pressure, but the magnetopause was being manipulated by test at CERN. There's no other reason that this would be happening. There's no solar pressure to the right. Look at that. No yellow bands, no red lines, nothing, no pressure. Our poles are being, magnetic poles are being pulled down both north and south. Now, what caught my attention about this A320 Airbus, it relies on electronic instruments and computers more than any other commercial air flights. There's just a few out there that even compare. It's got a very good safety record. But when you're flying over a monstrosity like CERN, the largest machine on Earth that is producing 
ma a magnetic field that is 100,000 times more powerful than our planets. You don't think it can affect these things? They may need to rearrange these flight patterns. I'm not sure this is exactly what happened, guys, but again, very good track record with this particular airline. It's a heads up, be safe. Have you ever wondered if the enormous power that CERN emits and other hadron colliders, there's 30,000 particle accelerators around the world, ladies and gentlemen, that we know about. How much damage and what type of effects are caused when these things are turned on and they blast up the volts? Now, this is an article from Physics. What are the effects of massive magnetic fields generated by the operation of the Large Hadron Collider? Well, let me just share with you this question asked. I think it's a great question. I read an article about the CERN Large Hadron Collider in which it talks about the magnetic field that is generated while the LHC is operating. A magnetic field more than 100,000 times more powerful than the magnetic field of the center of the Earth is generated. Could this greater magnetic field affect the equilibrium of our atmosphere and what effects, if any, could occur? The magnetic field at the center of the LHC magnet may be very strong, but the strength of the field drops very rapidly as you move away from it. By the time you are more than about a meter away from the magnet, the field is undetectable. These magnets don't have any effect on the surrounding environment. The worst thing these magnets could do is damage electronic devices that get too close. I work for a company that builds similar magnets. Below is a graph of the strength of one of the magnets we built. So will you just look at it? Now, does that really answer the question whether CERN is safe or not or whether it affects the magnetosphere? Eh, I don't know. I mean, I, I appreciate the, the person's response and I appreciate him trying to answer the question, especially with his technical knowledge on magnets. Now, I have a very close friend of the family that is 92 years of age and he worked with CERN and he actually built certain tubes that went into CERN and he used to work at the facility in Dallas before they closed it down that was a particle accelerator. Very intelligent. Guy's brilliant. So he showed me some of these um, vacuum tubes that are just fascinating and he also designed and patented, he has a specific, what is it, um, night vision patent. I don't know exactly which generation it is, but very nice guy, very kind. And we talked a little bit about CERN and I didn't really get an answer from him either, except for that, you know, obviously what they talk about publicly. And this is what I find fascinating right here. I mean, they even tell you publicly, here's CERN's website, accelerating science, extra dimensions, gravitons, and tiny black holes. Will you just look at it? I've got a short video here for you. It's um, about CERN. Um, the Earth's magnetic field is changing rapidly. Is this proof CERN is the cause? Stillness in the storm. Now, this is from the 3rd of February 2017. And, well, this is a, only a short video. It's only a couple of minutes long now. But first, February the 1st, 2017, more people are starting to question CERN's role. Definitely. Is CERN's Large Hadron Collider the largest machine on Earth? which is covered in electromagnets and whose dipoles generate 8.3 Tesla magnetic fields, more than 100,000 times more powerful than the Earth's magnetic field to blame. Well, is it? I will. Is CERN affecting the planet's magnetic field, which in turn literally affects us all, not the least of which by how it interacts with many of the functions of our pineal or master glands Basically, it's affecting the magnetic fields around the Earth, which is causing some pretty bad things to happen around the Earth and the people are connecting the dots. But that's not really what we're interested in. You tell me what they're doing. Well, first of all, you know, Rick, uh, what, what we're doing right now is there was a comment that was made. This is 20 years off. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. It's here right now.
We have a different kind of finalmente for you tonight. In case you were thinking we would finish this newscast without a mention of Halloween, did you think that? I thought to myself, ain't gonna do it, ain't gonna do it, ain't gonna do something on Halloween. And then this story crossed. We have to. It's about ghost particles. And we just couldn't help ourselves. So we're gonna do it for you. We're gonna show you this story. Actually, we're sending out our princess of mystery and intrigue on this one. Here is Artie's Natasha Sweet. It might not be the scare you're looking for on this Halloween, but intriguing nonetheless. A mysterious particle yet to be confirmed is bringing excitement to a group of scientists out of Switzerland. Certain researchers at a physics lab near Geneva are investigating the possibility of a new unexpected ghost particle. Scientists say the unknown particle may have appeared during experiments while using the Large Hadron Collider. The machine detector has pointed out bumps in their data, and these unknown bumps are said to be more than double the mass of a carbon atom. The interesting part is some scientists believe there isn't a theory at the moment that includes this mysterious particle. George Wieglin, a German theorist, says it's something being looked into at the moment. He says this does not exclude the possibility that such a signal could actually exist. On the contrary, it would be even more exciting if a signal were observed that does not seem to fit into our present models. While more experiments are still in the works, it's a possibility this ghost particle could be a new discovery. Senior scientists will be discussing their work publicly on Thursday about the undiscovered bumps. Scientists say if this discovery is confirmed by Atlas, it will be considered real and possibly something completely revolutionary. DNA sequencing and artificial synthesis. Since it is a fact that the synchrotron collider at Berkeley in Walnut Creek, California, was used to help sequence human DNA for the Human Genome Project. It is certainly feasible that the Large Hadron Collider could also be employed in a similar way, but with much more precise results. There is evidence to suggest that artificial human or human hybrid genos have already been synthesized at collider facilities, including CERN. What particle colliders actually are, are ways of making matter that doesn't normally exist in the universe. Are ways of making matter that doesn't normally exist in the universe. There is evidence to suggest that artificial human or human hybrid genos have already been synthesized at collider facilities, including CERN. Werner Heisenberg understood very well what quantum physics implied for humanity. In hearing within this theoretical realm, populated by obtuse equations and pipe-smoking scientists, lies what scientists call the Babylon potential. This is the secret knowledge, the scientific imperative, informed and driven by spiritual advisors, that the Bible cites is the key to opening a gateway for the gods. It is Ente Mulaki, Bob Alu, the opening of the Abzu, the doorway to hell, although Heisenberg may or may not have known. CERN is an abbreviated title for an ancient Celtic deity called Sir Nunos. Sir Nunos, whose name means Horn One, is thought to be the god of death and rebirth and the lord of the underworld. He is often depicted with rings or torques around his stag like horns or in his hands, which may symbolize the circle of destruction and restoration that he represents. To further concretize this idea, Sir Nunos is also depicted with a ring in one hand, and a snake in the other. Because of the cycle by which it sheds its skin, the snake has ever been a mystical motif of death and rebirth, destruction and restoration. On the 18th of June 2004, a two-meter high statue bequeathed by the representatives of India's Department of Atomic Energy, was ceremoniously unveiled at CERN. It was a statue of the Hindu god Shiva, engaged in the Nataraga the cosmic dance of destruction. Shiva is one of three members of the Trimurti, the Hindu trinity in which the cosmic functions of creation, preservation, and destruction, are personified in the forms of Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver, and Shiva the destroyer, who is also known as, the transformer. Occultists have always been aware of this fact. Even E. Francis Bacon, and his scientific contemporaries, many of whom were members of the mystery school, Deciphering the mechanisms of the material world was but the means to a far more important objective to make contact with the entities lurking on the other side of the veil. This veil is often described as a dimensional doorway that allows access into realms beyond the perceivable world. 
Many top physicists are quietly hoping that the proton collisions happening at the Large Hadron Collider will puncture the fabric of our four-dimensional confines and allow us to peek through the keyhole into another dimension or alternate universe. Sergio Bertolucci, director for research and scientific computing at CERN, made the following curious statement. The Large Hadron Collider could open a doorway to an extra dimension and out of this doorway might come something or we might actually send something through it. There is no question that the scientists working at CERN hope to open a dimensional doorway. The real question is what is the something that might come through when they do? There are many indications that the power players of our world, including the Vatican are preparing to make contact with the gods of the old world. There is no shortage of theoretical doomsday scenarios, many of which have not been propounded by unlimited laymen such as myself, but by some of the most esteemed scientific minds in the world. Every now and then, CERN will release to the public these strangely themed articles that seem to be worded in a very unusual way. Now the name of their most recent article is titled, Hunting Season at the LHC, and I have noticed that most publications that CERN puts out are usually very scientific and straightforward in those respects. But if you're paying close attention, you will be able to catch some of these cleverly made articles that seem to be masking a hidden meaning behind it all. So let's go ahead and read the article. With the LHC now back smashing protons together at an energy of 13 TeV, which stands for 13 trillion tera electron volts, what exotic beasts do physicists hope to find in this unfamiliar corner of the natural world? Okay, let's stop right here. CERN asks us the question, what exotic beasts do physicists hope to find in this unfamiliar corner of the natural world? This is so typical of CERN. They think what they are doing is so funny that they are constantly mocking us. They mock us in their videos that they put out, they mock us in their articles, and more importantly, they are always mocking God. They always seem to write these articles in a very whimsical fancy, like it's a big joke to them. Like when in a cartoon, when the mad scientist starts laughing maniacally when he is about to perform his crazy experiments. So like in the last article that I explained in my Spirit Wars series, where they were naming these unknown particles found in their large hydrogen collider, known as UFOs, which are unidentified falling objects, and ULOs, as unidentified lying objects. And then they release these creepy images of their beams from the LHC as if to showcase what they are in fact doing, which is releasing fallen angels or discarnate entities from the abyss. And I'm going to explain what I mean by this. So now in this current article, they are stating that they are hunting for exotic beasts in unfamiliar corners from our natural world. I have already gone over how the LHC is without a doubt mankind's greatest achievement. It can be likened to as our modern day Tower of Babel. We built it either out of spite or vanity with the underlying theme that there is no God, so we will figure out how to recreate the universe ourselves, or in other words, create our own heaven, just like what the Tower of Babel people were trying to accomplish by cheating their way up to heaven with a man-made staircase within a tower so tall that they could reach heaven without God's help or judgment. And to further illustrate this point, who was the Tower of Babel's infamous leader? It was a man named Nimrod, and the only description that we have on him was that he was a mighty hunter. Are you guys following me on this yet? So let's start over it again. CERN is located in Geneva, which could be another name for Genesis, which is the first book in the Bible about the creation of the universe which CERN is trying to do themselves by recreating the factors involved with the Big Bang or the beginning of the creation of the universe. Also found in the book of Genesis is the story of the Tower of Babel, which was about a civilization that got so idolatrous and wicked that they believed that they could reach heaven by building something that could get them there, basically circ circumventing God's laws. The legend goes on to say that it was a building tall enough to reach heaven, but who knows what it actually was. It could just be symbolic for a structure or technology that man had built to get into heaven. And their leader, Nimrod, was also known as a mighty hunter, which this article is so clearly stating that the people at CERN themselves believe that they are mighty hunters as well. And there is a theory that I have come across recently that explains that the LHC is actually what they call a stargate or a gateway and is connected to the constellation of Orion, 
which coincidentally is also known as a mighty hunter. This is a whole new theory that I wish to explore in the future in a later video for you guys. So stay tuned about that because it's a rather incredible theory. But anyways, and we also have found out that CERN is actually built upon the old temple grounds of Apollo, which is a part of St. Poulet, France. And this refers to the verse in Revelation about them having a king over them that was named Apollyon and Abaddon, which translates to the destroyer. And to further illustrate this point, CERN's own mascot that is sitting directly in front of their building, and they are not even shy about it, is named Shiva, which is also known as the Destroyer. And I find it odd that on Google Maps, this location is known as a place of worship. And I will also be showing in my next video on how Orion is also connected to NASA and their Apollo missions and how the LHC and NASA are actually working together for their greater purpose and hidden agendas. And we all know that CERN is most widely recognized for their discovery of the Higgs boson, aka the God particle, in 2012, the same year as the end of the Mayan calendar date. And like I have said before, this is how they mock God. They say, Oh, this little particle was at the very beginning of creation of the universe, so it must be God. And to further mock him, they search even deeper into the abyss of what is known as dark matter, like a magician pulling a rabbit out of his hat to try and release other particles, or what they are referring to in this article as exotic beasts. What Stranger Things calls the Upside Down, and what CERN has named the Hidden Valley, that is filled with antimatter and dark matter. That is their world. This is their universe. It is dark and scary, and nobody is trying to be there. Trust me. So they try and fight to take over ours. This is what they have been doing for centuries and have been doing for millennia. So what is CERN up to? Because you know which side they are rooting for. Stephen Hawking, Neil deGrasse Tyson, even the Pope declared it. I am only the messenger here. But I didn't want to make this video too long. I just wanted to give you a heads up to what they are doing at CERN. CERN is, without a doubt, our modern day Tower of Babel, where we have built up our own egos with pride and vanity to seek to replace ourselves as the gods of this world and of heaven, just like what Lucifer and his fallen angels sought to do at the very beginning. Because you see, we have it all wrong. And we are back to the very beginning of where our civilization first began. The same story of the Tower of Babel playing itself out all over again. It is no secret that our society has gone from bad to worse, from worshipping all manner of idols to becoming an adulterous generation and seeking to replace ourselves on God's throne. And what you are looking at is this lovely building right here in the United States called Fermilab. And Fermilab is a particle physics and accelerator laboratory we've talked about this over the last few years pretty much ad nauseum it's a smaller version just like all the other versions that are scattered all over the planet and their mission is to recreate the big bang and study the makeup of matter on a quantum scale that's what they tell us but that's not what I tell you they're doing, and that's not what many other people that delve into this arena quite often tell you either. And it turns out, if you look at some of the information that the people that work there do on their personal time, they seem to agree with me big time. Let's take a look at this, shall we? This stuff was sent to me by a subscriber named Mark. Mark C, we'll call him. And this is artwork that was done by one of the employees at Fermilab. Now, what is it you're looking at? Well, let me zoom in for you, shan't we? This is the artwork that they're drawing. Do you see it? Does all this look familiar? You see this? Trolls, fairies, demons cooking over a cauldron. And here's what appears to be another cauldron. And out of the cauldron, out of the boiling pot, we're having what appears to be what they tell us are galaxies, stars, so forth, and so on. Okay, let me see if I can do this without screwing it up. This is queer, huh? Okay. 
Here's another picture, and it appears to show the city and what looks an awful lot like what they show us a uh, atomic explosion would be. But that's just me being a dick, right? But here's even more. Now, here's a cityscape. There's the ocean, or maybe it isn't. Who knows? It appears to be New York, New York City, Empire State Building, One World Trade Center, the Haunted Building, Two into One, Jackeen and Boaz combined, Wheats and the Tears, whatever you want to call them. But then there seems to be some sort of incoming invaders from a very dark sky. But I could be completely and totally wrong. Who knows? Here's another one. Here's another picture by a Fermi lab scientist. So I just find it really unusual that their artwork, the people that work there, their own artwork basically depicts in art what I tell you in words. Do you understand that? Did I say, and I say that, do you understand that? Because did I say it properly? But as you can see, at some point, we'll open a door and something may come in or go out of it. Now, those aren't my words. These are old. You should know this. This is a very, very old article, and it's in the register, which isn't exactly a mainstream. As you can see, their little tagline, Biting the Hand That Feeds IT. Okay, this is a story from 2009. Everybody's poured all over this. And it says a top boffin. Now that means a top official, like we call it in the United States, an official person at the Large Hadron Collider. It says the Titanic machine may create or discover previously unimagined scientific phenomena, blah, blah, blah. And out of this door might come something or we might send something through it, said Sergio Bertolucci, the director of CERN. This is old news, but I'm just refreshing your memory. But think, look at these words. Think of what he said. And then look at this artwork by the Fermilab scientist. You see what I'm saying? This is art. Somebody sat down and took an incredibly long time to make all of these. And I would imagine if you spoke to the person that made these, because I have contacted him, I doubt he will hit me back, but I have contacted him because I'd like to know if he's one of the people that says he was inspired, much like Tesla, much like Einstein, much like everybody of note throughout history, including Steve Jobs. They've either figured out how to decode human DNA because they were taking hallucinogenic drugs and it quote unquote came to them or they had a dream. Either way, what's going on is they're having demons, demonic entities coming to them and giving them information that mankind would otherwise never have in a million years. Because let me ask you something. How do you build something as large and grandiose and complicated, complex and unprecedented as CERN? How do you build it the first time around and it works? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, think about that. How do you even come up with this ideology that, hey, let's build a giant loop and remove all the air and we'll super cool it and we'll use electromagnets to fire photons at each other at 99.99999% the speed of light. And from that, we'll be able to take the information garnered and figured out the Big Bang. How do you come up with that? Well, that's fairly easy to explain, but most people won't listen. For time immemorial, people have spoken about things coming to them or the little voice in the back of your head. Let me tell you something. I have a little voice in the back of my head that lets me know when I'm crossing the line, when I'm about to do something wrong. And then... I justify it. Well, this is the little voice telling me, if you do that, you damn well know it's wrong. And then this demon right here, that demon is justification. And this is the end game. But on that note, I digress. But it makes sense because this is where all this comes up, let alone the imagery, let alone the artwork. But think about the fact that these people are the ones that are actually using this, these machines to help mankind. And if you think about the story that they hand us, it's nonsensical. 50 years 
untold amounts of money, time, materials, and labor went into building this machine to prove a th something that's actually theoretical. The Big Bang is nonsensical, and it's also theoretical. It's unprovable, but yet they've gone through all this time, energy, and effort to make this machine to recreate the moments after something that's never been proven. Does that make sense to you? I hope it doesn't, because it doesn't make any sense at all. But I digress. Now, I haven't looked at these. This is, uh, this is straight off the cuff. This right here, I can't really make heads nor tail of it. It's very blurry. But there's the, you know, the cube, the omnipresent, always there cube, because that's what they worship. And they've worshipped worshiped it for time immemorial. And as you can see, Nicholson 1968's website, Do You See What I See, breaks it down very well. Nicholson goes over everything. It's always had different names. Kronos, Dionysus, Atlas, Hercules, Saturn. And it's also incorporated this imagery right here is Aleister Crowley's original design, this right here. And then if you just simply add these two things to it, you end up with the cube. And they're absolutely everywhere. It's in the middle of the meditation room at the UN. It's in the middle of the Star of David. Gateway, D-Wave. D-Wave, I mean, D-Wave in Fermilab, CERN, particle accelerators, they're trying to actively tear the veil, and then D-Wave will basically be the traffic cop. They're going to tear the veil. They're going to tear a hole in reality, and D-Wave's job is to, to stabilize that hole and keep it open. If that makes sense, I hope it does, at any rate. Can't really see these too well, but I did see this. And I don't, I'd just be guessing if I tried to look at this. I've got my glasses on and I still can't see it. Okay, there's the next image. I don't know why Justin Bieber's there. Next image, say no more. It's pretty much self-explanatory, right? Now this, I don't know if this is imagery or art, but this is very similar to the stuff that I found and I keep finding out in the desert of the Western United States. It's always like this. There's always a serpent and there's always a spiral, which is representative of a portal. More, more artwork from a scientist. These people believe in science and yet this looks awfully religious or esoteric, no? And it shows the pyramid. It shows the pyramid. And I get it. I get it. But moving on. I'm not exactly sure what this is. Now this right here. I have no clue. But it looks like it's either A, ancient drawings, angelic drawings, or demonic drawings. One of the three. I'm just guessing. Period. And this is a layout of the actual, the actual uh, Fermilab accelerator. You can see the token ring. You can see the FDDI ring, the gateway, Ethernet, Ethernet, the computers, the computers, so forth and so on. And Fermilab, 1985. And notice the very top. You have ancient Egypt. You have demons, goblins, and... Basically, the apotheosis of man type thing going on here. And you see a large, large summoning sigil on the ground. Drawing things like this and then arranging certain smells, certain lights, certain times, and certain movements of the stars. And you will indeed find yourself face to face with a demon. More of the same. Happy birthday. Look at that. Isn't that lovely? This is just absolutely loaded. Loaded. Now, when you look at all these things, pi over 3, LX, and all the Hebrew writings, the mathematical equations, so forth and so on, chances are, and it's a really good chance, that these are all summoning formulas because they hide them in artwork as they always have. It's the hallmark of the secret societies. 
This is Rosalyn Chapel in Scotland, and this allegedly contains instruction in the artwork to show you how to locate the Ark of the Covenant, which I believe is in Ethiopia being protected by a bunch of priests, believe it or not. But all throughout the chapel, built into all the architecture, all the decoration, all the decor is information that's allowing people to try, you know, they're, they're transmitting information through the building because they know it'll stand the test of time, which it has. Because do you have any idea how much time, material, and information would be needed to create this building? And yet they're all over the planet right now. And the explanations they give us for them are ludicrous. half truths at the very best. This temple in Scotland, as old as it is, has what appears to be DNA, everything in it. Things that they shouldn't know about whatsoever at all. And yet there it all is. But at any rate, I digress. Back to the pictures. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you get it now? Artwork, structures, so forth and so on. This is absolutely loaded. Because look at this picture. I'm sorry about the uh, moving it all around, but it is what it is. I'm getting a better computer, and I'm probably going to give one my old one away if I can get all the information off of it. But look at this. Happy birthday, blah, blah, blah. You have the three lions, one facing justice, one facing... I don't know what that says, rest, listen, I don't know, physics, justice, I don't know what that one says, but look at all this information that's built into this, incorporated into this, this could be, I mean, because does that make sense, with the number one next to it, there's Fermilab right there, there's what looks like an explosion, but this is a scientist, this is somebody, a man of science, where do you think all this came from? You see what I mean? What do you think all this means? This is probably something that came to him in a dream and he drew it as best he could remember it because that's how it works. When these people get this information from fallen angels, that's just exactly how it works. And more of the same, more of the same. On and on and on. This would, To me, this would be the an image of an explosion exploding photon and perhaps two dimensions facing each other, but I don't know, completely and totally guessing. Now this is beautiful. And this, for the flat earthers, is a boon because there's an alligator snapping turtle and on the back of it, everything going up, it's holding up the entire civilization. Research castle, accelerator castle. Operation, support groups, do, collider, mint, computers, CDE, research castle. Now feel free to pause this and look into this and try to decode it all you would like. And I'll be more than happy to play it because I'm just showing you this as I'm looking at it right now. Friends of Fermilab, you bet. You bet. Only the best. Now look at this. Look at this. How incredibly esoteric is all of this? This is what this is called Friends Friends of Fermilab. And of course you have the entire cube the entire cube situation going on. DNA strands, again that mysterious symbol, mushrooms representing psychedelics or tripping, like I said, that's a great way. Altering your mind with hallucinogenics is a great way to go and meet people you're not supposed to meet. And that's just all there is to it. A lot of people want to do out of body, all this stuff. If God has information to get to you, it won't be through crazy stuff like this. That's all there is to it. As above, so below. I mean, it couldn't be any clearer than that. This would be the upside down. And that's exactly what they're talking about. And it's exact. it's beautiful because... At least we know we're not going absolutely batshit insane. At any rate, there were many ancient prophets foresaw Abaddon rising from the underworld in this very age.
satanic human sacrifice by CERN employees in front of the god Shiva was called parody. But all occult masters understand that symbolism was a powerful invitation for a doorway to be opened at CERN. The secret origins of CERN are nefarious to the core. Sergio Bertolucci, the science director at CERN, admits that they're trying to open a doorway to a parallel reality, and they hope that something, unknown unknowns, he calls them, will come through it. And CERN was built right over Apoliacon, where the ancients believed the doorway to Abaddon and the bottomless pit exists. Technology today is being developed so that we can communicate with extra dimensional entities. We are talking ultimately about that same character that according to the scripture is the king over some very terrifying things that scholars believe is somewhere within the belly of the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, but this book specifically um, takes on what's, you know, what's happening right now. Uh, in the world? What's been going on with CERN? Why are particle physicists so intrigued by this uh, idea? Sergio Bertolucci, who's the head of their science there at CERN, saying, we are going to open a doorway uh, into a parallel universe and something could come through or we may send something through. He's coming right out and saying He's it? saying it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he said that in, a, in, an, uh, in an interview with the press. We are going to open a doorway and he said behind it could be unknown unknowns. What, what is the Large Hadron Collider, which is at, where they conduct these experiments at CERN? Uh, Josh, what, what are they trying to do there? Or what, what, what do they tell us they're trying to do? Most of the stuff that they are doing, they're not really keeping secret. You know, they're hiding it in plain sight because they'll come out with quotes like that, that they want to open a doorway. They want to communicate with extra dimensions. Uh, it's mind-blowing stuff that they don't really make a secret out of it. But the, the real secret is in uh, convincing the world that things like quantum physics are too complicated for the normal layman to to get their head around so don't even bother trying mm -hmm. and then that leaves them in a position where they can do whatever they want uh, at places like the Large Hadron Collider. It, it's, it's similar to the, the position of the Roman Catholic Church through most mm -hmm. of the Middle Ages that the scriptures were only could only be entrusted to the, the clergy yes. and that the lay yeah. people were not allowed to read the scriptures because it was beyond them to understand and they needed to have them interpreted for them. So in the same way, this church of science is doing the same thing. You don't understand quantum physics, let us explain it to you. Exactly, that is exactly right. They've admitted to wanting to open up doors, use gravitons even to communicate with higher uh, dimensions, or a lot of really strange stuff. Were not some of the employees at CERN involved in that viral video yes. that everybody saw? Yes. Can you explain that? Yeah, apparently, and, and there's there's a couple different versions of the story, so uh, I think we're still kind of trying to figure it all out. But the, the official version, if, if we choose to accept it, is that uh, researchers at CERN got together to pull this prank of a, of a human sacrifice right in front of the Shiva statue. Mm -hmm. And uh, even, even if that is the real story, and it very well could be that it was all just a big hoax and it was just a joke, it was the researchers. It wasn't college kids that broke into the uh, institution or anything. It was the actual researchers doing this mock thing. So why are they even thinking about They're that? They're just trying to well, it, yeah. Just pull, pull a joke on, on conspiracy theorists around the world and just well, say, maybe oh. it's deeper than that. Well, yeah, because yeah. Uh, for people who did not see, and they can go on right now, of course, they can go on YouTube, they can go Google it, and they can find the video and watch it for themselves, and you see these dark, hooded characters mm -hmm. walking out in front of the Shiva statue. They bring a woman in there. Uh, it appears that they stab her, and they murder her, and it's a satanic sacrifice. This disturbing footage was shot outside of CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, showing CERN scientists conducting what looks to be a satanic human sacrifice ritual, similar to the one conducted by the elite Illuminati in the Bohemian Grove every July. The ritual, which appears to be a mock human sacrifice, was conducted in front of a giant statue of the Hindu god Shiva. Rumors about what CERN actually is doing have been rampant since its creation. This Wall Street Journal article says that they are seeking the secrets of the universe or maybe opening the portals of hell. 
but the, the thing that came to my mind was, first of all, even if it was a hoax, why would credentialed individuals, you know, with passes to be able to get into CERN, employees, why would they be conducting a dark parody yeah. of a human sacrifice. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, this says something about the mentality. I mean, beh behind the scene, what are they talking about amongst themselves trying to open a doorway? And then it, it also takes you to the, the, the uh, Gothard tunnel ceremony where it seems like this same mindset is going on there in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. That whole ceremony was about using paganism to bring something up from the depths mm. and through blood sacrifice there it, it, it starts at one portal because it's a dual track you have a portal at one place and a portal at the other so they started at the northern portal sorry the th southern portal i think and they went to the north and during that journey they show at the very end this long ceremony that has a massive display of, uh, of footage that they have, have created. And they use dancers that are suspended from wires to make it look like they're digging into the earth. And they uncover something mm -hmm. after the deaths of nine people who died. In, and this was true, nine mm -hmm. people died. But they show three in this recreation. And it shows them falling down the tunnel giant hands reaching up to pull them down mm -hmm. and once they're all down this gigantic entity emerges and all the dancers in the front are reenacting war games they're enacting sex magic they are bringing forth the the the, the triune goddess the triple mm -hmm. goddess mm -hmm. and she is mating with a horned god mm -hmm. who may be hernunos mm -hmm. himself mm -hmm. uh hern of the the uk area mm -hmm. also krampus mm -hmm. of the uh the teutonic regions and they, they give birth mm -hmm. they're trying to bring something up from the earth yeah. Dancing construction workers, angels with giant heads, and whatever these things are. It's a surreal ceremony for the opening of what's been billed as Switzerland's construction of the century. Leaders from Germany, Italy, Austria and France joined Swiss President Johann Schneider Amann at the spectacle in Palleggio, Switzerland, where a record-breaking 57-kilometer tunnel now cuts through the Swiss Alps. The Mammoth Engineering Project links the stations of Esfield in the north of Switzerland to Borio in the south. Work on what's now the world's longest and deepest tunnel started 17 years ago. With a guest list that read like a meeting of the United Nations. When you celebrate science, perhaps it's best to not get carried away. The inauguration ceremony included some, uh, how should we put it, original choreography. It was quite bizarre. <laughs> Aida Lamy, do you associate uh, this kind of dancing with the inauguration of a tunnel? <laughs> I don't understand it's art enough. <laughs> it leaves me speechless. So the internet has been ablaze in shock over what transpired in Switzerland with the opening of the longest and deepest tunnel in the world conspiracy research community and regular folk across the spectrum alike were in disbelief what many are saying was the most open satanic occult ritual of all time even much worse than the 2012 olympics but it was truly shocking it has definitely hit me to my core when i first saw it especially the end of the ceremony my heart was heavy and it's just difficult to watch but I was reassured that after what I just witnessed there's going to be some disturbing and bizarre times ahead more than we've ever seen that much that much we should realize um, these Freemasons these so-called ruling elite they now know they can perform outright blatant satanic rituals short of literally sacrificing a human being on screen and easily get away with it. They don't care. They no longer care. It's just another indication that shows you just how close we are. 
we're in the final phase of a plan spanning hundreds if not thousands of years and if what transpired in in Switzerland doesn't wake you up to that I don't know what will this ritual was a ritual for the unleashing of the underworld Gothar tunnel underground CERN underground as you'll see in this video the connection between this tunnel the ritual performed there and CERN goes far far beyond being in the same territory and both being underground but there is definite viewer discretion advised because there's a lot of very disturbing imagery in it now this happened in Switzerland near the Swiss Alps Air show and bizarre performance opens the longest tunnel in Swiss Alps. A spectacular air show marked the opening of the world's longest record-breaking rail tunnel in Earthfield, running for 57 kilometers through the Swiss Alps. The ceremony continued with a freakish show where some of the half-naked performers dressed as goats allegedly tried to express the hellish work through the mountain or the fact that the gates to hell are now officially open. Let this sink in here for a moment. This is how the secular world, a Russian newspaper, described this event where four heads of state were at. Even the secular world states that it was a freak show and that it strongly hinted at and conveyed to them that the gates of hell were open. That's how blatant this show was. With the main performer being the dancing goat and other blasphemous references to Christ in this event too as well. They even parade around the lamb and even, again, secular world it was looking at this and saying what in the world is this showing this is so bizarre this is a freak show what are they showing here they're doing this openly many blatant references to Cernernos and pan figures and satyrs in connection to parading the dead lamb around mocking the lamb of god at the same time while the goat figure is dancing around celebrating all during this Cernernos dance and the witchcraft and pagan occult illustrations they were involving here with blatant witchcraft dances as well. They're displaying sparking forges and evoking video imagery on the wall referencing hell as well. Other pictures from being in the forge and the fires emerging at this time and red flames all this coming together while the gates and the doorways are opening bathing everything in red. This event was truly disturbing. It truly does disturb you when you watch the footage of it. This was most certainly an occult event. And they show all the red and the bloodshed that is associated with opening the door. And when they open the door, smoke emerges. Just like the Bible talks about when the bottomless pit is open. Smoke emerges as though from a great furnace. And a train comes rolling in. There's going to be a portal open. There's going to be a dimensional highway made. And things are going to come out of it like the Bible states. And we talked about just several weeks ago, at the same time as all these other events starting, how they were blatantly letting the world know the gates of hell were about to open. With the Inferno trailer with Tom Hanks, bringing that onto the scene in connection with a lot of other things we've been studying as well, prominently featuring trains in the trailer too as well. Because they use it as a picture of time, time traveling, moving a long time as well, but then also as a cue card to look for other events tied to the messaging as well with the train tunnel and we talked about how in the trailer they talk about being in the underground and rivers of blood because they know all these are tied together the one leads to the other and they know there's going to be a massive release of shedding of blood and ties in with all the messaging they've put down before with the da vinci code blasphemy and the angels and demons film which was filmed at cern all these are connected by subject matter. CERN definitely does seem to be part of opening the bottomless paint. We've talked about that before. And they're now announcing that hell is about to be unleashed. The mystery of iniquity is about to be unrestrained. And then just two days after that, they again prominently featured on Bing. The gates of Hades being opened with their Orcus reference. Referencing Hades, the underworld. And we've seen a lot more messaging in between that, but then just recently on the 31st, a commemoration of the hell of Verdun using some of the same public figures who were also involved at the tunnel ceremony, Merkel and Hollande, bringing attention to the hell of Verdun, and we talked about that, and with the lighting evoking their same color messaging. And then the very next day, they went to the tunnel opening where they commemorated Sir Nernos and pain coming from the underworld and persecution and bloodshedding celebrating openly that the gates to hell are about to open. They don't need to hide it anymore.
I do want to reiterate here again and drive home the point that it is irrelevant whether or not we believe the Bible to be true, Satan to be real. The important thing to understand and realize first and foremost, if you are a non-believer in the spiritual realm, spiritual warfare, etc., is these people do. And they are literally carrying out an agenda based on these ideologies. This is the reality. So in order to understand the bigger picture, understand why they perform rituals such as this, you must understand things biblically and spiritually. Let's take a look at various symbolism of this ritual and break it down in terms of time and space, CERN, and the opening of what is called the Abyss, as described in Revelation. These are aspects I've covered from time to time and it seemingly culminates with this ritual and only further solidifies my conclusion regarding the real agenda behind CERN. So what we actually see playing out in this ritual is Revelation 9-11, and that states, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name Apollyon. And as we can see, the 9-11 memorial in New York, called the Infinity Pool, is a direct reference to Revelation 9-11, and that is no coincidence. It is a direct reference and representation of the bottomless pit, the abyss, the black void. This is what they've shown us time and time again consistently throughout history in their occult structures and locations all over the world. 9-11 Memorial, Infinity Pool being a prime example. Even RT News wrote an article on CERN and revealed the quote-unquote curious connection between Apollo and CERN. Quote, now on top of all the speculation as to what CERN scientists are really attempting to do with their LHC, many observers cannot help but notice that the town in France where CERN is partially situated is called saint Guinness poi The name Poi comes from the Latin Apollyacum, and it is believed that in Roman times a temple existed in honor of Apollo, and the people who lived there believed that it is a gateway to the underworld. It is interesting to note that CERN is built on the same spot." End quote. So CERN was built over the ancient site of Apollo, aka Apollyon, the destroyer. The name Apollo was often linked in ancient Greek writings with the verb Apollyme or Apollyo, meaning destroy. CERN's Shiva, of course, is also known as the destroyer. With that said, let's look at the actual symbolism of the ritual. Let's look at the first part of the ritual, the obvious Satanism, and the worship of the Angel of Death, the Angel of the Bottomless Pit, the Baphomet androgynous figure we see here. It's the Baphomet Angel of Death archetype with androgynous features. You can see male breasts, and that is quite disturbing, and it is exact representation of Baphomet. Here we see the green man is escorted out, surrounded by all the goat horns, and the green man, of course, is synonymous with Cernunos, the horned god of the underworld. Moving on to the second part of the ceremony, where we see a display of projected images onto a, a wall or a screen, the workers form an eight-spoked wheel just before they breach through the mountain wall. Eight-spoked wheels are depicted as time and space mechanisms throughout ancient artworks. They are synonymous with transcending space-time. This is why CERN's detectors, particularly the Atlas detector, is designed after the eight-spoked wheel, the eight-spoked wheel of time, because it is a time and space mechanism. This, make no mistake, is not by accident. On the projected screen, we see the mountain is now breached representing the breaking of the veil of reality. The workers are then sucked into the void of a portal where numerous specter-like hands are reaching out to them. Quite, quite disturbing. Chaos ensues and specter-like entities are released into this dimension. We now see the horned god appears in the black void the abyss coming out from the bottomless pit. The underworld is unleashed. At this point, we can now see the strong parallels between Gothard's ritual and CERN, particularly CERN's occult film ritual, Symmetry. Here you can see naked entities in the black void of the abyss 
is depicted in both Gothard ritual and CERN's occult film ritual, Symmetry. So after the collapsing of time and space, the merging of dimensions, the opening of the portal and unleashing of the underworld, we now see a clock is shown to be in disarray, going forwards and backwards, representing space-time manipulation or distortion. The same time distortion symbolism is also shown in CERN film symmetry. A brief close-up of the watch of the character named Lucas, which is a name that has been said to be an allusion to Lucifer, shows time going in reverse before abruptly stopping. Further exploring the connection between Lucifer or Satan and time, an interesting side note, in the film Winter's Tale, Lucifer, played by Will Smith, has a dialogue with one of his demon minions, played by Russell Crowe. In this scene, Lucifer informs his demon how he has no comprehension of the simple ebbs and turns of time, and eludes his understanding. Since Satan is also known as the Serpent or the Dragon, and the Serpent is another variation of the Ouroboros, which is a symbol of time, we can see why Lucifer places so much emphasis on the construct of time in this scene. He is also shown reading the book A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking, although it is essentially unnoticeable unless you search for it, emphasizing once again the connection between Lucifer and time. All you have to do is pay attention to what the media telegraphs regarding CERN. When you see Wall Street Journal, for example, recently release headlines such as, quote, CERN is seeking secrets of the universe or maybe opening the portals of hell, end quote, and openly discuss conspiracy theories and address conspiracy theories about CERN, you know the CERN occult agenda is real. It's really happening. They are literally attempting to crack time and space, merging dimensional realities in order for the unleashing of the underworld to take place. This is why they've injected themes and symbolism associated with time travel, dimensional travel, CERN, particle collider, time distortion, portals, dimensional doors, and so much more in our media more than ever before. On one level, People will dismiss any notion of the CERN occult agenda being real, dismissing the possibility CERN is creating dimensional doors because it was shown in science fiction. It was shown on this TV show or that TV show. This is how they condition the populace on a subconscious level to accept these scenarios as purely science fiction and not possible. But make no mistake, what is seemingly science fiction is literally manifesting in our reality. This is precisely why it is possible reality itself has changed or been altered. Because when human beings are tampering with forces they should never be tampering with, opening doors they should never open, the result is likely something most humans cannot even begin to fathom or comprehend.
try to explain it away as well. This is just the Swiss culture. All of these uh, elements in this ceremony were, were are elements of the Swiss Christmas tradition. And so it's not satanic. Nothing oh, to see here. Move they along, didn't really watch it. This no. is a six hour long video. Right. And, 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 and you're right. I watched the whole thing. And it just says to me that the author of that piece does not really understand. And, and this is why we're communicating this to you, because we need to understand that we are in the middle of a battlefield and there are elements out there that are being presented to us in plain sight, mm -hmm. but saying nothing to see here. This mm -hmm. is just culture. Mm -hmm. This is not satanic. This is not antichrist. Um, I, I caught another connection that I thought was really interesting. The number 17 is affiliated with the green man, mm -hmm. Osiris. Which is her new nose. Which is her new nose. But 17 mile circumference mm -hmm. yeah. yes. CERN, it took 17 years to complete the Gothard Base Tunnel. Yeah. Ah, you know, it was actually originally designed back in the 47, I think. An interesting year. A lot of mm -hmm. things happened 47, mm -hmm. 48, mm -hmm. including the Babylon Working. The Wargame Babylon Working with Jack right. Parsons. Yes, which is Aleister Crowley. Right. Talk about wanting to bring something up. Right. Well, and, and, and that point about Aleister Crowley uh, is important for another reason, and that is what I said a moment ago, that even if this was only a hoax, even if it was only a parody, they're at uh, CERN to be conducting what appeared to be a human sacrifice. Um, Aleister Crowley, Anton LaVey, the mm -hmm. Church of Satan, they've all written extensively about the power of parody, that when you are, when you're conducting a ritual, the dark Satanists would say blood makes it even better, makes it even more powerful, especially innocent blood, the blood of a child, the blood of a virgin. Mm -hmm. um, but even without that, conducting the ritual is potent. It has the potential to invoke something to to awake something yeah. one of the experiments yeah. that they you know they conducted the yeah the awake yeah. experiment uh, and during the awake experiment again people can go and google you know, want to be careful of the hoax stuff that's yeah. out there right mm -hmm. where you got ufos flying out of vortexes <laughs> and this is stuff people made but there really was phenomenon mm -hmm. going on in the sky close to CERN when they were conducting the awake and it was actually very frightening looking stuff mm -hmm. I mean mm -hmm. it looked strange it did look like some kind of great light or something was trying to peer through the clouds yeah there was kind of a spinning motion you know in the clouds so uh, I would say it's not a coincidence. I would say that when you have people at CERN conducting satanic mm -hmm. rituals in the open, telling us they want to open a portal, then the, in Switzerland having the Gothard Tunnel, I'm not going to say it right, am I? But <laughs> the, the tunnel opening, I can't speak German, right? <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, that it, it, it's a very clear message. They are trying to invoke those old gods. Mm -hmm. And if you watch that video through to the end, this horned demon thing becomes king of the earth. He does. He's mm -hmm. crowned, that's and what, then he dies. That's right. And at the very end, the, the the singers and the dancers get together, and they're all bringing their offerings mm -hmm. to the new god. And this new god again was born through a mating ritual with the triune goddess, right. which is just another word for Diana or Artemis or, or Hecate, mm -hmm. Hecate, the queen it's, of witchcraft. Exactly. Right. This this triple goddess. And <clears throat> excuse me, they in on the big screen they show the roots, not the tree, not the the branches, the roots. Mm -hmm. It's all about underground yeah, show worshiping underground. the things underground. Mm -hmm. It's an inversion of what God designed. Mm -hmm. And of course, from the Bible, we know what's underground, yep. and we know that it is going to be invoked. And so the technology exists now. Uh, from what from what we from what we understand so um, my question is what are they going to be communicating with yeah yeah who, who is on the other side well it's obvious from prophecy from scripture that the the entity that is underground now that is in prison now can't break out mm -hmm. he has to be let out mm -hmm. and and we see in prof in scripture that an angel comes down and has a key to the bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. Can that, is that key literally a key or can that key be knowledge? Well, here's the interesting thing about, about Abaddon. Um, it says that he's the king of the bottomless pit, but it never says anywhere that he's in the bottomless pit. So with he could be the free locusts. roaming the earth he, now. He could be, and yeah. he's just, he's, he could just be the king of that Did place. I, did, did you just see like a light bulb go off <laughs> over my head? Because seriously, I've never heard anyone Isn't that amazing? That. Yeah. Yeah, it, it never says that anywhere. So he could be out now. But I do think that uh, the opening of the abyss is going to, uh, well, it's going to give him his, his, his army, you know, yeah. the, the, the locus of Revelation 9. But I think it's also going to allow power. That, that term, that word key in Greek can also mean uh, permission or authority. 
Uh, so, and we read in the very beginning of Revelation that Jesus is the one that has the keys of death and hell. Mm -hmm. So at some point, Jesus is giving permission because of a judgment, you know, he, he's, he's judging the world and uh, he's giving permission for uh, this angel to open open this abyss. There's also something uh, connected to that that mm -hmm. is implied in Revelation 9 where it's talking about the key to the bottomless pit and the mighty angel uh, and uh, Abaddon, uh, you know, ascending. Mm -hmm. But in Revelation 9, so these things come up out of the earth, these insectoids that are transgenic, that are like parts of different kinds, they're torturing all of humanity. Mm -hmm. But but that chapter ends, verse 21, it says about the people who um, have committed all these sins and that are being judged by these insectoids and being tortured, it says, and yet they repented not of their sorcery, Sorceries. which is mm -hmm. the Greek word uh, pharmaka, pharmakia, pharmakia mm -hmm. uh, from which we make phar pharma uh, pharmaceutical. But th the whole idea around the ancient pharmakia was that this was like an illegal activity in which you're trying to create through mm -hmm. science, through the use of drugs, through mind expansion, you're trying to open a doorway to put yourself into contact with what's in these other dimensions. So yep. how does this maybe tie to what CERN is trying to do where it says, and yet mm -hmm. they repented not of their pharmakia, of their attempt mm -hmm. to open a doorway. And it's almost as if that text is, is saying, you asked for it, you got it. <laughs> exactly. Let the door open and yep. now you are in contact. Right? You know, yep. I, I, I'm finding this really fascinating because there's an aspect of the research I've been doing for a forthcoming book that, that relates to this because Revelation 9 is where we also read about uh, after the the abyss is open and these locust-like demons, which which are what we see as Joel's army in Joel mm -hmm. chapter yes. 2, I would argue, uh, the four angels bound to the great river, uh, the river Euphrates are, mm -hmm. are released at the uh -huh. same time. I was just reading an academic paper the other day that argues that the book of Daniel is a record of the war between Yahweh, the, the God of the Israelites, and now the God of mm -hmm. Christians, mm -hmm. uh, and Marduk, the God of the Babylonians. And when that, that final stroke of that, that war where Marduk is defeated and his kingdom, Babylon, is turned over to the Medes and the Persians was the episode at Belshazzar's Feast where you see the finger of God oh. writing on the wall, mm -hmm. many, many take a parson. Yeah. Um, is it possible that one of these entities in the river Euphrates is the god Marduk? Mm. Oh. Well, certainly, again, the tunnel ceremony, they are invoking those old gods. They are calling for those old gods to come through Absolutely. a dimension. They even illustrate a portal, a, mm -hmm. a doorway do. being opened. And right? all these eyes looking uh -huh. at people. Right. It is the strangest yeah. ceremony. It's very dis disconcerting. So what I would say, the irony here, Derek, is that probably the occultists believe that more than many Christians. Right, do, yeah. right. right. Well, and that's why we're doing this program, because that's where we need to get educated and get caught up with what the occultists already know. In fact, I heard uh, a yeah. gentleman who was familiar with the occult a couple of years ago made this observation that uh, occultists who understand that they're in the middle of a spiritual war against Christ and Christians mm -hmm. view most Christians as people who believe in or who are practicing a very weak form of magic and that we don't even know that we're now, of course, we, we're not. It's not sure. magic. Mm -hmm. We, we understand we can already communicate yeah. with other dimensions through the power of prayer. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. But they, the, the occultists at least get this part of it right. They understand they're in the middle of a spiritual battlefield with their gods warring against Yahweh. Well, and this has always been the goal of the occultists is the raising ceremony. The Freemasons, mm -hmm. the raising of Osiris, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in ancient Egypt, Pharaoh, the raising of Osiris. And we know that the magicians of Egypt were also very powerful yep. uh, and could do many things that border, were supernatural or borderline supernatural. Mm -hmm. So this has always been the goal and it still is today. I mean, the prophecy of the on the great seal of the United States looks yes. forward to mm -hmm. the time when, uh, and actually that's Osiris Apollyon. Apollyon is the Greek way that you would say Abaddon, yep. right? Uh, and uh, But Apollyon's also identified in the scripture as the spirit that's going to inhabit the Antichrist. Right. Paul, Paul says he will be the son of perdition. Mm -hmm. That's the Greek word ap, 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 uh, Apollo, yep. Apollyon. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, and uh, Revelation, isn't it 17, 8, somewhere right there says, 
that it will rise up out of the bottomless pit and go into mm -hmm. perdition, Apollo, Apollyon. Mm -hmm. So the Bible tells us that what these occultists are trying to accomplish, at some point it is going to happen. Yep. Their devotion is to that God. They think this new golden age of the gods is going to triumph over Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And so you're right, it is a battle between the old gods and the new gods. I think it was Zechariah when he prophesied the coming of the Christ at the end of time talks about that he will be at war with the old God. Mm -hmm. right point, or we, we began down this road, but really didn't, didn't get to this, the, the location of CERN itself, um, it's a very expensive facility, mm -hmm. and normally this is not the kind of thing you would put on the border between two sovereign nations, yeah. because you get into turf wars. Is there something, you know, what, what was so important about the location of CERN? Why did they put it where they put it? It's so strange, because you would think logically it makes no sense. You know, you have this big 17-mile machine uh, on the border of France and Switzerland. It's also underground, which mm -hmm. there's no real reason it needs to be, you True. know, just from a scientific, yeah. you know, it can work above ground just as well as it could work below ground. It would have been cheaper to construct. Yeah, it would, yeah. because they wouldn't have to dig everything out, but uh, they spent the extra money to put it underground uh, in, on the border of these two countries. But the weird thing is, when they were doing construction, they actually had to stop construction because they found ancient Roman ruins. Right over the, the construction, there was an ancient city called Apollyacum, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's how it looks when it's spelled. It's called Apollyacum, and, and it, it's where they venerated the Roman god Apollo, which, of course, connects with Apollyon, mm -hmm. Abaddon, and, and stuff we were talking about in the first program. So really strange where, where they don't offer any real um, scientific reason why they would construct it there. The only reason is because of the location. I, I think that uh, the people in charge know that that location holds some type of significance. Actually, that ancient culture thought that that was the bottomless pit. No. Uh, yeah, and, and so I, I think that what happened is they, people still believe that today. People believed it when they were constructing the Large Hadron Collider. and. Because of the work that they do, they they put it there to try to harness the the, the power that they believe is going to come from that. Mm -hmm. hmm. The uh, the idea that uh, this may somehow uh, o open a different dimension. You mentioned during the first program that uh, representatives of CERN have said that they believe that th that's something that they could accomplish with this machine. Mm -hmm. um, as Christians, looking at the reality into which we've been placed and trying to make sense of the idea of additional dimensions. What, what, can, what do we know from the Bible about additional dimensions and, and why should CERN concern us? Basically, pun, pun. <laughs> <laughs> basically the way I've seen it, and, and in our research, we, we've come to this conclusion that the term extra dimensional and the term spiritual are pretty much synonymous. When we talk about uh, the spiritual realm or the spirit mm -hmm. world or, or even, even heaven, um, that's what physicists are talking about when they yeah. say extra dimensions. It's the same thing, just looking at it from different angles. So when they say that they want to look into higher dimensions or communicate with higher dimensions, basically what they're saying, it, it comes out of Genesis. They want to reach into heaven. Well, they, they think last year that they did film gravitons <laughs> escaping into we don't know where. Yeah. They just went away. I mean, matter doesn't just go no, away. Yeah. The we're, particles we're all stay that. there. Yeah. yeah. You showed me an online video as like a really popular physicist out there right Brian now. Green. The, yeah, Brian yeah. Green. And the, in that video, uh, he's interviewing one of the other physicists, and that's what they're talking about, gravitons. Mm -hmm. And maybe gravitons will become the method by which we can string together a coded message and send it through to the other side to say, hey, we're here. Come see us or come eat us, as Steve Quell was saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, but I mean, they're they're very, very, almost a deadly serious. You, you had uh, Dr. Heiser on not long ago, and, and we were talking about Mount Hermon, and this is where the uh, ancient Hebrews believed that this was the doorway mm -hmm. uh, into uh, Sheol Hades, into yes. the underworld. Well, Jesus is standing there with his disciples, and he <laughs> says, the gates. So here's this terminology again, the gates, gates. of hell mm -hmm. gates. will not, mm -hmm. yeah, plural gates. And then of course Isaiah, he prophesies that same thing, open the gates, plural, open mm -hmm. the gates ye ruler, I give command and I bring them, giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. Yep. So the Bible says this is going to happen. These people are trying to put themselves, some of them, in league with those supernatural entities because I think they too believe. Yep. And again, maybe more than many Christians, that a war is coming mm -hmm. and they're picking sides. Is virtual reality 
and augmented reality, going after these things, you know, everybody's wearing those headsets now. Mm -hmm. Is that and can that be ritualistic behavior? Oh, absolutely. Yep. The, old, the old preachers would remember the little Sunday school song, Be careful, little eyes, what you what see. You Be careful, yeah. little ears, what you hear. Because your ear gate, you've written about this the past, yeah. the ear mm -hmm. gate, the mind gate, the eye gate. Uh, these are doorways into our soul. That's right. And so uh, this is why, uh, you know, in the New Testament, when they start talking about Jesus as being deity, the, the Pharisees want to run screaming and plugging their ears, right? This goes back to that old belief that mm -hmm. you have to be careful what you allow your mind to entertain. Mm -hmm. And so through our pop culture, very slowly, we've introduced people to these ideas. Through transhumanism, we're yeah. going to augment ourselves. We're mm -hmm. going to change ourselves. Yep. Well, we too believe that happened once before mm -hmm. uh, when the watchers came down and tinkered mm -hmm. with human genetics. Yeah. So, yeah. But and the interesting thing about this is we had Opal Singleton, who is the director of the, uh, uh, the ministry MillionKids.org. She combats uh, sex trafficking of, mm -hmm. of teens, and she's found through her work and points out that the research shows that we are raising up a generation of children who believe that if it happens in the virtual realm, mm -hmm. it doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you have physicists that are basically saying that we're living in a virtual world uh -huh. already. Right. Exactly. So nothing so counts. So nothing counts. Yeah. Yes. Anything you do is okay because it isn't really real. You're not really accountable for what you do in the virtual realm. And she mm -hmm. uses the example of a very popular video game, I won't mention the name, where in order to advance you have to uh, have sex with a prostitute and then to get the money back so you can advance in the game you have to kill the prostitute mm -hmm. yeah. and kids are like you know, she asked a group of high school students does it bother you and like four out of 120 raised their hands and the rest is like well this doesn't matter because yeah, it's not it's real. real well yeah. so that that's a process of desensitizing mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh, make them it's a, they become an easier victim right. uh, but the same thing is happening on a global cultural sociological exactly. scale exactly uh, in that if you can imagine back when you know TV was in Invented and it was leave it to beaver if all of a sudden that tunnel ceremony would have happened it would have people would have screamed that it yeah. shut their TVs yeah, off absolutely. they wouldn't let they their eyes see it, it. Yeah. today they're watching it and they're saying oh isn't this interesting yeah. but now, even it, then when you think back to that that j simpler more innocent age one of the most popular television comedies of the early 60s was I dream of genie right, where you were right. summoning a yeah, demon right. from exactly. a bottle yeah. Exactly. Yeah. but that right, was right, okay right. and bewitched and, and yeah. bewitched yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so early on yes but it, it, let's go back to this other question for a moment and it is this idea is it possible that these people who are invoking this darkness like at the tunnel ceremony or these people who are putting on the parody of a satanic sacrifice in front of the Shiva, we should probably also talk oh, yeah. about Shiva. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is it possible that those actions literally can bring to manifestation, incarnation? Can it rise up from the underworld? Can they actually make that happen? And here's a uh, an interesting text in scripture, uh, Ezekiel 13, 18 through 20, and this is God who is actually talking about the ancient Hecatean and, and yes, that magic right. that is used yeah. to cause the spirit or soul of an individual to take flight so that the underworld Raphaim or an underworld entity could rise up and become incarnate mm -hmm. in the spirit. Now, we would say that can't possibly happen. You can't dispel the soul of an individual. But let, and this is King James, but listen how God talks about that. It says, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that make the cassetop. These are magic armbands mm -hmm. that they used in magic. Uh, and make kerchiefs upon the head of every uh, 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 stature, magic devices. And, and by the way, this term here means of all kinds of stature, including giants, right? Mm -hmm. uh, listen, to hunt souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people and will you save the souls alive that come unto you? He's now talking about dispelling souls and raising souls. Will you slay the souls that should not die and save the souls alive that should not live? Right, oh. and when you when you read this in the Hebrew, it literally uh, it, it's almost like a plant. It talks about it budding up from out of the ground and coming to life. Right, mm -hmm. so if it if it wasn't possible, why would God even be saying, "I am against your magic, and I'm going to let those who belong to me, I'm going to I'm going to save those souls from your magic." So this is astonishing. Mm -hmm. It's ancient witchcraft. It, and it evidently was very powerful. Maybe this came directly from the Watchers, right? Mm -hmm. The Book of Jubilees talks about mm -hmm. the, the magic and the... the oh, yeah. And, you and know, the, the women was changed and, to form, Right. Yeah. Uh, that it was recovered after the fall. So, and, and then, of course, again, the Freemasons. They claim that they have the power to raise the spirit of Osiris from the underworld. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 
there definitely is a dark occultism that is mm -hmm. going on here. And again, I mean, I'm, I'm throwing out a whole bunch of stuff that people are going to say, what did he just say, right? <laughs> but we, we go into this in the book. We yeah. explain what it is we're talking I, about. I have to ask this because this is something we haven't talked about yet, but it's certainly very obvious. They're not trying to hide it. There's a statue of a Hindu god, the mm -hmm. chief god of their pantheon, oh, yeah. standing right out in front. Who is this god? What does he represent? And why the heck is he there? Yeah, Shiva, the, the god of destruction in, in Hindu culture. I, and yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, really interesting parallels with that, um, and, and even what's written in the inscription. Yeah, there's a there's an inscription on the base of the of the Shiva goddess statue there, and mm -hmm. at the entrance to CERN, and it and it is dedicated to uh, Shiva as the the omnipotent god. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? I mean, yeah. in the past, especially in Christian. America, we would have said there is only one omnipotent God. That's mm -hmm. the God of the Bible. Well, evidently yeah. they've replaced the God of the Bible at CERN with the God of destruction yeah. that yep. destroys at the molecular level yeah. and then mm -hmm. reassembles. And yep. the, the other part yeah. of that that's interesting is like in early in this program or last week's program, uh, you know, we talked about the prophecy on the great seal of the United mm -hmm. States. That too is looking toward a time when, the, when Apollyon is mm -hmm. going to rise up from out of the underworld, Abaddon, uh, and become the king of earth and give birth to a new golden age. Mm -hmm. Well, in the mythos of, of uh, Sheba, that's what it is supposed yep. to do, that at the yes, end of time, exactly. demolecularize everything, reconstruct everything, and give birth to a new golden age. Another interesting thing about Shiva, that one typical pose for Shiva to take is that he is standing on the dwarf of ignorance. Yep. He represents science, mm -hmm. knowledge, and, and the crushing idea of Luddites like us. Right. Yeah. We, we see this in the reporting of the media on, on the Hig this discovery of the Higgs boson. Oh, yeah. Uh, there, there was a story about Shiva at... Uh, CERN that I was looking at where they didn't even get the gender of the god correct. They called her a goddess. Um, oh. But she's, w w the, the Higgs boson, um, w why is that an example of how poorly the major media does reporting on events like this? It's a perfect example. Well, most people know the Higgs boson by its other name that physicists hate. It's <laughs> called the God particle, and most Christians hate it too. It was just for pub publicity. That was the only reason it was called that. And by misnaming the particle, of course, it made people believe through the reporting that if we discover this particle, we've unlocked the secret of creation. Yeah. And so yeah. we don't exactly. need to, we've discovered God and he's just a particle. Yeah, it has nothing to do with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think the bigger lesson here is that if the media can't even report on that basic discovery correctly, they're certainly not going to report on the spiritual aspect That's right. of the discovery. Um, what I think people are going to find very fascinating about this study, though, is the blend. Mm -hmm. between science and uh, physics and metaphysics. Yes, exactly. You know, uh, the blend that is there because, again, this is this is biblical. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned a moment ago that we're in a spiritual warfare. Can you imagine what we're saying when we say that through prayer I can change particle physics? Oh, yeah. For instance, mm -hmm. healing. Mm -hmm. Through prayer, literally what is going on with the decay in your atomic structure can be modified. I can affect reality. Mm -hmm. You can reverse entropy. I, that's right. I yes. can reverse entropy. Yeah. So we are in an amazing period in time where we're learning more and more and there's a lot of good that's coming out of CERN. We are learning a lot about yeah. particle mm -hmm. physics, right? It's just that we are concerned about the occultic undertone that there is there and we and there definitely are some who are working there who believe in what we would call the dark supernatural Absolutely. to be avoided, but they're trying to put themselves into contact with it. Yep. CERN is now talking about building a particle collider that is at least four times bigger than the one that they have now. One interesting detail right out the gate is the structure and the shape and the positioning of everything that they're building, going from the smallest little rings up to what is now their large Haldron Collider. This is the big super collider they've been using for some time. Every time we speak on CERN and the testing that they're doing, we're talking about this big facility that is near Geneva, as you can see here underground they are now talking about making this massive one cern wants to go supersized they're saying that it's unveiling plans for this replacement for the lhc now i don't know that this is going to be just a replacement this looks to be just something way grander Meaning that I feel that they're still going to be utilizing the Large Haldron Collider for many different tests and things of that nature. If not, tying it in 
to this bigger one somehow because it really seems to me something bigger is coming together here. The way everything's set up and aligned here, they're so secretive about all this. And let's not forget, this is a group that was stating last time that they were seeking in one of, the, one of the latest experiments in trying to basically fold the fourth dimension of space-time into this one. Now, you know, that's in the realms of punching a hole in space-time, wormholes, things of that nature. And we've shown this in different clips, even different movies and sci-fi films that have been put out have hinted at this exact same thing. And we've talked about, what do you use if you can do this? What, what are you going to use to bring in entities, if that is the, the goal? Something like the Large Haldron Collider? What if you could only get something through that would fit through it? What if you needed something larger to let something larger in? Or more go through? A lot of questions. A lot of secrecy. And there's a lot more of these colliders, so to speak, around more than what people think. Even here in America, we've talked about the ones up near Illinois and in other locations that they have... Uh, these, these big projects ongoing, but when you hear CERN saying that they want to build a particle collider of this size, I think it's something to pay attention to. I'm way more interested in trying to take a step back and look at all these pieces in a very broad sense and seeing how they all fit together, uh, because it's, it's amazing how they really do. And how much the interplay of the concepts of like electricity and energy or dimensions and spirituality or frequencies and vibrations you know positive negative and so on and so forth all these terms and concepts and themes they interestingly enough they they permeate both the realm of tesla's quote fringe scientific discoveries and the realm of new age mysticism and spirituality So this is something I want to tread very carefully into by recognizing and re-emphasizing the fact that we know that Satan has taken every aspect and every element of God's creation and somehow twisted it, commandeered it into being a vehicle for spreading his lies and Luciferian doctrines. And it's always about turning people away from worshiping the creator and instead worshiping some part of the creation. And so, for instance, we can look at something like uh, the very fascinating topic of cymatics and the experiments, which many of us are already probably familiar with, um, involving the use of various sonic frequencies on a, on a plate covered with sand or salt, and the grains arrange themselves into different complex patterns based on the frequency. And, you know, this is no magic trick or you know, work of sorcery, but it's absolutely an incredible demonstration of how indeed this interplay of frequencies and, and matter and energy and geometry, they're, they're a very real element of the created world somehow. But then of course the New Age mystic and the occultist will be all too ready to point to that, something like that as an example of the reality of things like sacred geometry and how it all goes back to the flower of life and the existence of higher spiritual dimensions and consciousnesses and everything else. So. We have to walk a rather fine line here sometimes with this kind of research because we're, we're constantly having to work to exercise discernment between acknowledging the various pieces which are simply part of God's amazing creation and you know, perhaps been obscured by materialistic um, Darwinian, Einsteinian uh, physics and, and pseudoscience and such. And which pieces are then satanic spin-offs of these hidden realities but then have been twisted into various occult mythologies and esoteric symbolism and everything i mean if you if you do a quick youtube or google search on the taurus or the toroid uh, you will very quickly begin to see that the taurus itself is employed heavily as the central new age icon and concept uh, you could almost say that it serves as a sort of encapsulation of the basics of New Age theology. 
Um, they'll talk about how the torus is found in many natural forms within nature, very similar to something like the Fibonacci sequence and spiral. And, and of course, how even in the globe model, the electromagnetic field is said to be toroidal in shape. But then it goes way further into it being sort of a way of visualizing how energy is supposed to simultaneously flow inward and outward during meditation. And the torus is actually used even as a visual aid in meditation, sort of like a, a type of mandala. And it's also used in a very generic sense to represent the whole idea of the ebb and flow of energy, the cyclical in and out, how everything is connected, and you know how the, the all is one and the one is all. And you know this is just the whole idea of monism or oneism and, and so forth. But throughout all this kind of intense research on electromagnetism and toroidal energy, uh, for, for whatever reason, I keep thinking back to the verse in Ephesians 2, where, where Satan is called the ruler of this world and the, quote, prince of the power of the air. And I've, I've actually long wondered about just what exactly that phrase in that verse might mean, since... Most commentaries will tend to focus on just the basic idea of Satan being in control of all the earthly systems of man and the ruler of the fallen world, and, which of course is absolutely true, but what about that, quote, power of the air? I mean, is that is that just about flying or the heavens and the stars or whatever? But as I've been digging into all these crazy rabbit trails involving Tesla and Doddard and the universe, uh, the electric universe idea, it's getting harder and harder not to think that it might actually have to do maybe more with just the plain and obvious interpretation of it being the power that we've all seen crashing through the air during a lightning storm. Now, when you contemplate this idea in conjunction with a lot of the pagan mythologies, which feature a god of thunder such as Thor, or of course the Greek god Zeus with his thunderbolts and everything, it to me it would seem to fit to fit together in a lot of ways, um, since those, you know, those quote gods are really, in the end, nothing more than just different archetypes for Lucifer, anyhow. And, you know, and speaking of art archetypes, you have the whole Prometheus myth, and, you know, this idea of stealing the fire of heaven and giving it to man as a gift and everything, and, you know, like I said, there's so many avenues to explore and dots to be connected that it's, it, you know, it's pretty incredible. And so the the bottom line for me is that it is it's the creator who made all of these forces, all of these dimensions, all these systems which somehow work together. But you know, Satan as a fallen angelic being was privy to all kinds of knowledge about the creation that we humans were not. And so whatever the physics and uh, and or metaphysics of the enclosed world system might actually be, Satan has actually known a, a whole lot about it since before humanity was even in the garden and personally i believe that things like this electromagnetic universe concept might really make sense as a vehicle through which he's working to bring science and spirituality together under one banner into one cohesive thing it's into this era of spirit science that we're being primed to accept and embrace the, the coming antichrist and this miraculous power that he will seem to have. And he and his power will be embraced by all sides, by both the religious and the non-religious, by both the mystic and the materialist, by both the occultist and the scientist. And so that's my thoughts on all this. I just kind of wanted to cram it all together, throw it out there. So here we are at CERN. Sonified Higgs data show a surprising result. All right, now I'm just going to read this first paragraph because it kind of just does summarize what's going on here, but I'm even a little reluctant to do that, but I'll tell you why in just a second. So scientists at CERN have been using new techniques to try and learn more about the tiniest particles in our universe. Our unusual, uh, or excuse me, one unusual method they've utilized is to turn data from the LHC into sounds using music as a language to translate what they find. Awesome, right? We've been talking about how it's sound, tone, frequency, music, it's all tied together with CERN. So you read more and more, it sounds great, and then they show you this little video, you click on it. Turns out it's an April Fool's joke because they ended up showing, oh, we found in the data Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. 
uh, so it's you know, and it's like oh, gags on me. But then if you get up here, did you enjoy your April Fool? But if you want to know what CERN scientists are actually doing with sonification, then you can find out more in our video here. So you click the video, and it takes you here, tells you all about it, and there's even, I guess, an even longer version that you can download or something. Um, or maybe it's the same one, I guess. I don't know, but it's awfully big for only being 3 minutes and 25 seconds. But if you click the video, the real legitimate video, you find out, no kidding, for real, they are using music and sound to work on the data at CERN, which they've already know everything. they got all this stuff. I honestly don't believe that this is a, a, a new epiphany to them or a new technique. They've been doing this for a long time, but they got to give you breadcrumbs and they got to act like they're just discovering this stuff, even though they're way far ahead than what they're, they're letting the public know. But anyway, the fact of the matter is, is they are absolutely 100% using sound and music and tone and frequency at CERN. And you got to love this, man. This chick dressed in purple playing the flute there. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. They even have this, uh, there's a, a South Park episode called Pandemic. And it's about a pan flute band playing their little flutes and unleashing all hell on earth, letting the demons out, and they tear up the world. Not making that up. But they even talk to these two scientists in the video, and this one here, she even says, we are, we are using sound to explain to people. I'm, this is what she said word, word for word. Look, she says, we're using sound to help explain to people where their bodies are in space. So, once again, the whole tone... Music, frequency stuff is not new age nonsense. No, it is not. Remember I did this video a few months ago? The old school He-Man, Masters of the Universe, and this little red-headed Phoenician guy makes this little musical device, and he says he calls it, calls it the cosmic key, like musical notes, like in the book of Revelation when it says they're given the keys to the bottomless pit, not like house keys, not like car keys, but probably just assuming and speculating that given the keys, the keys being musical notes, tone, frequency, whatever. And in this movie, he says, this little Phoenician guy, he even says, the opening portals, opening stargates, no big deal. It's getting the music notes right. That's the hard part. And I hate, man, I hate, I hate using NASA as a source because they're garbage, but it doesn't change the record or the official narrative that they have named the rings of Saturn, D, C, B, A, F, G, and E, just like a musical scale just like music notes. And remember the Olympics, the Rio Olympics, which doesn't even look like they're going to have now, but that's not that's beside the point. Logo, their logo for the Rio Olympics looks like a trumpet to me. So once again, tone, music, sound, frequency, not new age nonsense. Right here, out of their own mouths, they say they are using it at CERN. Music can almost take you back, almost summon feelings and emotions that you felt years ago, almost like a time machine. Say if you had an experience with a loved one years prior and you hear a song and that song can take you back and bring up those same feelings, those same emotions and bring you back to that place. So with all this being said, we want to let you know that music is powerful. Music is a weapon. I'm almost reminiscent of the story of the Pied Piper whenever he came into town to lead the rats out of the town by playing his magical flute, I believe it was. And he led the rats out, and the townspeople didn't pay him. So he actually came back wearing his bright colored clothing and playing his songs. But this time he got all the children to listen to him. So he was able to take all the children out of the town and keep them there with him. And I, I think that's what's going on now when we look at mainstream media and the mainstream music and understand the messages and the symbols and the different um, colors and all these type of things that's leading our generation through. If you have anything to add with um, on you know those opening points that I made, if if if, if you have anything you can add to that. Well, music goes even further in that it establishes an archetype, and the archetype can actually exert a force on the ether and cause things to materialize or happen that normally would be physically impossible. This is what the Pythagoreans were basically into. And it proceeds preceded by well, the science of numerology, where numbers themselves have specific powers. And if you use the what's called the Chaldean number system, and you look at your phone numbers and your addresses and the addresses and phone numbers of people that you have relations with, you'll find that there's a common numerical denominator through all of this. And Pythagoras 
developed a system of ratios for logarithmic proportions, which today we call music, but at that time it was not designed for entertainment purposes or to be performed. It was more of a, well, it's kind of hard to say. It was kind of like a key or a, an access for them to get into these higher dimensions. Mm -hmm. Whenever we're talking about uh, the work of Pythagoras, I think a lot of people who aren't familiar with his work can understand. They may be familiar with the term the Pythagorean theorem, which is how we we measure music to this day. Correct? Well, the Pythagorean theorem is is more of a geometrical thing. It's, it actually is, a, is the fundamental theory of alternating current. It's very interesting that music and alternating current theory almost run hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Well, Pythagoras was, is, is establishing through the musical interval a set of ratios. This was very important to them, was a set of ratios which were given number. And it was this number itself that had the power. It wasn't the music being performed as an entertainment or for other people to listen to. It was almost kind of like a voodoo thing. And, and Pythagoras believed that by establishing a system of ratios, we could ascertain as humans where we fit in the infinite long rhythmic period that goes from the tiniest things to the largest things of the world, which the Pythagoreans viewed as a sequential progression or regression, and not like today where it's disjoint uh, particles and atoms and, and things that don't even make any sense anymore. Mm -hmm. Pythagorean system consists of is a succession of tones which relate to wavelengths. So basically, the higher the pitch, the shorter the wavelength. Mm -hmm. So the proportion between these wavelengths, like 3 to 2 or 2 to 1, this is, is what the Pythagorean system is about, is a sequential series of these tones, or what we now refer to as melody. Uh, what you're referring to is rhythm, which is more of the timing of the thing, and the ratios, you can have the similar proportionality and rhythms, but you don't actually have the wavelengths and frequency. It's a differential thing where it's only at the dividing point of the measures in music and you hear the sound. It's not continuous. Mm -hmm. Now, around the time of Kepler, to the church music, what happened then was the simultaneous sounding of tones, which are now known as chords, which have the effect of producing materializations in space, depending upon planetary alignments and solar conditions and things that we don't even know about. And the church, at that time, up to Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, basically the church is through the pipe organ and the acoustic dynamics of the church, which is extremely complex. Uh, I don't think anybody with the most advanced computer programs could ever duplicate that stuff today. Some of those pipe organs had as many as 15 or 18,000 pipes. Mm -hmm. And these were specifically designed to work with the church, which was kind of a uh, like an electrical network of coils and capacitors, but on a level, and then this thing called the cosmic energy out of the dielectric field of space with its copper roof, and it basically was a substation to God. It really doesn't differ too much than the transformer hanging on the pole outside your house, which takes the electricity, which is to be completely unmanageable and dangerous in the house, and then brings that to a level where it's useful to the your appliances and what have you without just getting vicious and piled on you and, and blowing everything to smithereens. The church performed a similar function up to the time of Bach. It also generates a lot of its own frequencies and tones. Yeah, I know they claimed that they was able to record some of those tones as well. Yeah, well, the, the most, uh, probably the best example that's immediately available to the public is there's a person named Steve McGreevy. And he has a website on the Aurora Chorus and Aurora Sounds and he spent damn near a decade during optimum circumstances of bringing magnetic loops into Canada and intercepting the electromagnetic fields of the aurora. And, uh, and it's on the Internet. You can find these sounds. And uh, there's some of these recordings. I mean, I've, I've heard these things, and I about fell out of my chair. You can't tell the difference between the sounds of the aurora and the sounds of, uh, of the deep-sea animals. They make the same mm -hmm. types of noises. 
Yeah. And that principle, if I'm correct, is the same principle with the Om tone. Whenever those who are of the Buddhist or Hindu tradition, whenever they would sit in a circle and chant Om, it's supposedly the sound of the song of the sun emanating that sound, and they get on one harmony with that. Yeah, you could, you could hear the harmonic, uh, you know, the aurora tones, and for me, I'm into the telluric stuff, that the earthquakes and volcanoes and mm-hmm. uh, hurricanes and those kind of things generate. That's the, the bulk of my research, and that's what my project is right now. Also produces a, a lot of interesting, at the, at the beginning, the onset, before this, the main seismic event, uh, there, I've heard recordings of other people have taken of what sounds like uh, giant Tibetan gongs. Mm-hmm. Uh, my equipment picked up like like screaming sounds and and yeah. yips and uh, and there's all these frequencies, but the wavelengths are so long and the velocities are so high on this type of stuff that that we only exist in a very higher harmonic of uh, these frequencies and wavelengths, which could. And then this story crossed. We have to. It's about ghost particles. Particles, but fields. So, but that's not really what we're interested in. You tell me what they're doing. 